Recording is on. Hello. So um, I let you introduce it. You. Okay. So this is the Extinction Hardy meeting number eighty, and it's October the seventeenth. So what uh, should we do? So I I wanted to go over some of the AI stuff that we were talking about in the Western meeting last time. But since Ryan is on this meeting, I'd like to go over that. And then Gary's got a couple of points about writing, reading and writing. Um, so I think we can weave both of them together because they are related. Um, so let me let me start with, with those things and just say something about the previous thing about AI. So just to recap where we got to with the AI last time, I made a point that uh, Ryan said, seemed to think was just armchair philosophizing about what is intelligence. But I think it's very important in terms of deciding, you know, what AI is as a threat and things like that, what its future is, is you have to decide what it actually is. And so I think the way to do that is, is by deciding what intelligence is and is it intelligent. And so my view is it's not intelligence, it's borrowing from human intelligence. And so it's a very profitable line to pursue what intelligence is. So in my view, AI is an extension of the alien cortex. And so it's, uh, it's, it's not a thing in itself. So, you know, if you, if you categorize it as something like, well, it's something that pursues a goal in a given context. Well, a lot of things could be said to do that. You could say, you know, like a ball thrown up in the air uh, has a goal of reaching the earth in, in the context of being thrown up and coming down again. And, but, you know, I don't think anybody would call a ball thrown up in the air intelligent. It's just following the laws of gravity. So I don't think you can make an abstract kind of definition of what AI is. You have to say humans are intelligent and artificial intelligence was designed to mimic humans and exceed them. And so you say, well, what part of humans? Well, it's a very definite part, and it's the alien cortex. So it's kind of the alien cortex is brainchild. And so pursuing the question of what is an intelligence and is the alien cortex itself intelligent, I think is the, the way to answer all the questions about what the particular dangers are of AI and things like that. So that's what I'm going to propose is that we we take it from that angle and then um, start with Gary's questions too. So Ryan, you got something to say? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think the um, a, a nice place to start is to kind of dismiss some some common uh, common viewpoints on artificial intelligence to say what artificial intelligence is not or what the the threats from AI are not because um, I. I think Hollywood and and um, you know just popular culture uh, kind of leads us astray a lot. Um, so uh, first off, I think that um, you know there there's this kind of Star Trek um, distinction of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, or, uh, uh, like if you if you tell some robot that <laughs> some some kind of metaphor or some kind of uh, you know, infinite loop thing, then it's just gonna just fry itself and get confused. And um, or if there's um, some kind of uh, just just quick question: Can you hear too much background noise? Is this? Uh, it's okay. All right. It's okay. It's okay, okay for great. me. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so uh, I think that the um, there are. Uh, for, for a long time, a lot of the algorithms that uh, were popular in artificial intelligence were very specifically 
alien cortex like. Um, so uh, some of the theorem proving type of you know prologue style AI where you're just doing logical inference or um, a lot of those algorithms are very very specific uh, just trying to encode solutions encode logic in a computer with the you know uh, decision um, encoding your decisions uh, and that's that's essentially just copying uh, human reasoning to some approximation um, and knowledge embedding it into uh, into a computer which is just totally not AI <laughs> not not a, not impressive at all in terms of uh, its ability to be creative or or um, explore a problem space that um, in, in some novel way so that's that's one thing I think we um, uh, something I shared in the group before was the the Dolly um, you know creativity thing where you you type some text uh, and then uh, the computer invents an artwork uh, that you described right so uh, this is this is an example of something that's really not um, the that, that doesn't seem very alien cortexy to me um, in terms of uh, the 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 kinds of intelligence that are typically thought of like Vulcan reasoning type of thing, um, and then uh, so so that's that's one misconception. I'm not sure I captured exactly um, all of the color around that, but uh, but we can start with that. And then there there is another uh, misconception, and that's that. Uh, when we're talking about threats from AI, that the threat is Terminator, that you know robots are going to take over, um, and that's just not a problem. Uh, I mean, it could be a problem with autonomous weapons and this kind of thing, but it is uh, so much more expensive to build a reliable robot that doesn't just break, and uh, like a robot that could repair itself and heal and and produce. Uh, be a von Neumann constructor that can make copies of itself and stuff like that's it's such a an intractable problem that it's not a threat the the threat is just server side software like the things that observe us and 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 can uh, make decisions in our legal system in or in our um, you know the the ecosystem that we have so uh, I'd say like things like thinking around Excel and 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 um, you know the the data that we collect and things like that—that's that's more of a risk than than uh, robot overlords uprising. So the the threats that I mentioned in the last video, I think, are far scarier than anything Hollywood has thrown at us, um, because it's it, Hollywood doesn't tend to describe the problem as if you have an objective function. If you have a goal seeking behavior that there are thousands of ways that goes wrong and you can't enumerate them all. So if our AI listens to us and it's halfway competent, then we're in danger. So that's that's the bigger issue. So those are those are two two kind of um, clarifying points I think that we can um, that can put some some boundaries around the uh, conversation that that will help us break free of the common misconceptions about AI. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. So the um, I totally agree with you and like I I think that that is uh, the the we must dismiss all those popular things that uh, Elon Musk is talking about that we must become augmented humans and then start having implants and things silicon implants and uh, because otherwise we're going to become pets of ai that that is is uh the hollywood version is the 12 year olds version of of what ai is but ai as a systemic kind of threat is um yeah it's i agree that's the longer problem or the, the deeper problem there, there's a couple of things though to highlight and that's that we heading into i think we're at the end of the road pretty much in terms of tech in general um because well we're in the last we're in the end game for tech because of all the other things that are catching up with us like you can see the collapse happening and so 
the the systemic kind of AI um, that's in server farms and in the cloud and um, doing uh, big data number crunching um, is the it, it doesn't have much longer to go. I mean, it's got uh, a long way to go, you know, in terms of surveillance in the end times kind of thing. But in terms of you know, is it a risk to civilization? Civilization is already collapsing. So it's um, it's going to be a victim of it before some of the long-term scenarios can come about. In other words, we, we, we have this tech dystopia where we all serve the machine. So we, we all have to, we all already serve the machine from, from the beginning, I think that it was a case of us serving the machine and it was always sold as the machine will serve man. But if you go back, um, I think that one of the first and key problems with uh, machinery and AI in general is that uh, is they very quickly become our master. In other words, you can see it in all sorts of levels. You can see people go out and buy a car thinking, well, that will give me freedom and autonomy. But pretty soon they're running a job and to pay a more, you know, to pay the car payments, and the car is really ruling them. They're sitting in track, you know. You can see them now sitting in in the in lines at the gas station in the UK to try and get energy. And you can see like who's serving who. <laughs> I don't think that. I think you serving that car. The car's the master. It's not you. Um, so that that is the danger all the way back and i would like to kind of highlight how far back it goes because if you uh if you ask people when the idea of a machine uh, came about they would i think they generally say well industrial revolution you know, 1750 maybe the steam engine what um then a few people would say well it goes back further that heron had a you know turbine and there's the antikythera method antikythera mechanism that maybe archimedes made but it actually goes back to a mindset, and I think that's important. It goes back about at least 10,000 years. And yeah. the evidence for that is, uh, it, yeah. I, I just wanted to interspace something, if I can, briefly. Is, is yeah, yeah. You've got the origins of the machine in like the five basic uh, elements, like the wedge, the lever, um, the wheel, I uh, can't think what the other two are now, but there's got like the five fundamental principles that underlie every mechanical machine, at least, which predate the actual creation of complex, you know, machines that are made up of a compound of, of the basic elements. But they're, they're already there in, in levers and wedges and wheels and, and axles and uh, just so, just the, the the basic elements that human beings were using for a long time were, yeah. were the seeds from which all the rest. I, of I, I agree; those have been around uh, for a long time. Uh, but I I would take it back even further. So um, because I, I like what Hugh is saying about a mindset, um, and I think it's uh, a, a machines can kind of. Um, uh, are somewhat parasitic on on um, on the ability to, to do kind of abstract reasoning, and um, uh, there's uh, Houtzinga, um coins the the term for uh, uh, Homo sapiens as Homo ludens, the the playing playing man, and I think there's uh, uh, some truth to that in in a system of abstract rules. Um, they're they're like board games from five six thousand years ago that that um, that are still you know, viable games and that's a that's a very clear alien cortex activity where you are um, you have these laws of uh, abstract game rules that 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 create a virtual world in a sense that you can manipulate um, and I, I think that's uh, that's part of the the um, the 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 origin story i think in terms of you know how you how you create machines how you create this um uh you know what darren allen would call the system you know well yeah so yeah what i was where i was going with that was the the evidence for machines is very specific so it goes the the first evidence is is uh, a yantra so a yantra is the Sanskrit word for machines. And it means literally gadget, mechanism. And it's the, 
the yantra is 10,000 years old. So they, in, in the Indus Valley, they have the concept of the yantra and the machine. Now, it's important because it's those guys are Indo-Iranian, if you want to be clever and try and avoid the word um, Aryan, or otherwise proto-Indo-European, if you want to be politically correct and try and pretend the Nazis didn't exist. But they, they really Aryans. They call themselves Aryans, and it's an Aryan thing. So the, the idea of a machine is an Aryan thing. And you, you've got to say, well, uh, and it's older than 10,000 years. So it's all, you've got to situate it around about Gobekli Tepe. And so you, ha you have to say, okay, so if it is a, a frame of mind, what is it? Well, it's two things. And I think you can clearly see, although it's not a popular theory by any means, um, the, uh, this evidence for it in the genes and, uh, you know, just my theory that it kicks off with the hybridization of Cro-Magnums and Neanderthals. And you, you can see what's happened, or at least I think I can, because the Cro-Magnums are goal-oriented. They, they're hunters. So, so what Gary was saying about reading and writing, he said, you know, your first question, Gary, about, you say, you know, if you don't actually write things down is how do you keep track of things? Now, the key word there is track. So, so the, the idea of tracking something comes from spur and the hunt. It's the idea of tracking down a goal. So you essentially, hunter, and African hunters were hunters to exhaustion. So they needed a tremendous concentration on a goal. And I mean for days, Some, you know, they would tra either remember a kill. So in other words, like the Sam Bushman, they, um, they have fletches, so the arrows are poisoned, and they fletch the animal so that, that it will die in about a day. So they have to, you know, get close enough to the animal, just graze it with the poison, and then they have to come the next day to pick it up. Um, and so to do that, they have to be expert trackers and keep track of spoor, and that spoor really becomes writing. You, you can see... Uh, the, there's a lot of evidence for the glyphs and things that uh, are, appear on rocks. They are definitely hunters. They, they are reading the ground. You know, I'm, I'm very conscious of, like, I think Leaky or somebody like that, or the guy from um, Born Free was, who lived with all the lions and that with his wife. And he said he never read newspapers. He said his newspaper was, was the mud because, because he would go and, you know, go down to the river in the morning. And he could see in the mud that, oh, a lion has appeared in the vicinity. And, oh, you can see how many, you know, how many impala went through. And everything was written in the dust and the dirt. And that is how it is for, for Africans, not, not for Neanderthals, right? The tracking is not really possible in peat bogs of Europe. So you have to see this mindset of these very, very goal-oriented and to the point where they evolve. It, it becomes part of their genes. So the reason why, you know, Kenyans won the Olympics uh, in terms of running marathons is purely because they have thin ankles. That's that's all it takes. You need to be long and skinny. Um, and in one particular region in the, in Kenya, they, they have thin ankles. And they hunt us to exhaustion. They basically run after deer for days off, you know, a couple of days, three days even. So they that's the... Um, the genesis of that hunter mindset all the way down to the genes. You know, but I'm, I raised the thing about ankles because it means we've been doing that kind of hunting for so long, it's gone into our ankles. Now, it's, it's very interesting <laughs> that the word uh, spur is the same word for, for spur. And it, it means, it's proto-Indo-European meaning ankle. So when you say tracking, you know, how do you keep track without writing? It's it's a very, very sound Bushman hunter thing you're saying. You're saying, how do I pursue my prey without uh, you know tracking the spoor? In other words, with writing, reading reading the ground, which is what they do. The trackers are reading the, the spoor, like writing, literally in a line, like writing. So you have to say, so the very first answer to your question, Gary, about uh, how do you keep track is, why do you want to keep track? You, you are thinking in terms of saying something I say or something that comes up as, uh, as being something 
to gain. So you think it's a goal, I must catch it, I must capture it, <laughs> and, um, and I must keep track of it. So it's, it's a very pursuit-minded thing. And that's not what I'm, I'm saying. It's all the things I'm saying, you're better off not writing them down. So in the cult I was in, there were, you know, everybody would come for the first year and they were trained, you know, from university and stuff to write notes, take notes, children. And everybody would take notes. But they would tell you, once you got into it a bit, they'd tell you not to take notes. Because the thing is that uh, they, they're trying to communicate something in context. So this is the very first danger, and this is the first danger of AI, is if you, if you write things down, you're taking them out of context. So there's no way, there's no way you can you know, um, put them back in the context again later. Um, or if you do, it's in your imagination. Right? So in other words, you're not actually going off what, what was said at the time. In the context of the time, um, you, you are actually probably not concentrating while you're writing, and you'll probably make, make up a fiction around uh, your notes when you go back to them. So the, the very idea of trying to capture an idea, gain from it, like a hunter, is part of the danger of AI and uh, that, that goal. And the reason is it's out of time. It's out of time and place. So it's kind of like, you know, we're talking about like batteries and, and why the Piraha don't have fridges. It's because it's dangerous. In a, in a chaotic environment, in a Kairos environment like what the Piraha live in, if they had fridges, if they stored their food, so they, you know, they fish and get birds, but in a jungle environment, they would be un overrun by vermin and things, and you'd get very sick if you ate a fish that's been in the, hanging in the jungle for, for too many days. So it's, it's lethal for them to store stuff. Now, in terms of food, it's the same for us, for brain food. We live in a chaotic environment, and what people are continually doing is going back to what, you know, somebody said in some big quote or some, you know, something Karl Marx said. Well, Karl Marx, when he wrote Das Kapital, was talking about very specific time, very specific context. And the same with the Bible. It was done for hunter-gatherers as basically, literally, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And now people pull it forward into the urban in setting in New York. And you say, like, for fuck's sake, man, leave that thing back where it was. It's like, you know, when hunter-gatherers told each other how the galaxy worked around the campfire, that, you know, it's much better that those words die in context. Campfire. So, in, in other words, like, James C. Scott was talking about the Zomia people. The Zomia people had reading and writing. They, they gave it up because they moved into the highlands and became anarchists. And the, the, it's very beneficial. James C. Scott talks about the benefit of not having that kind of memory. So, so you don't want a rigid memory. You want a pliable memory. You, you want people and the society in general to morph their history according to the, the current situation. So it's, it's unintelligent to have things cast in stone. So we think in terms, again, this hunter capture thing like this, is we think we got to get the facts straight. We got to get the history right. And we argue about the point of history because everybody knows that, you know, history is power. But if you can control the historical now, like look, look at Israel, look at the Zionists, they, they you know, you must remember, you must remember. Why? Because it gives the Zionist power today. It's like the Holocaust is, is long gone, right? So why do you want to remember it? Oh, so it doesn't happen again. Bullshit. <laughs> it's, you want to remember the Holocaust because you want to keep on guilting people because you want power. So whoever controls the past controls the future, just like, it, you know, it said in 1984. Whoever controls the past controls the present, and, the, and whoever controls the present controls the future. So it's all about control. Writing is always about control, authority. So if you want, so the reason why you want, want to write is you want authority over what, you know, remembering what, say, happened in a previous meeting. That's why you write notes. 
So you can get command and authority and control like a hunter gatherer. You can you can actually pursue a goal. Now that's uh, that's not something you want. You want it to be. You want the past to be plastic, and so the past serves the present. So in other words, if you don't write down about the Holocaust and you don't chisel it into stone and you make memorials and stuff like that, the how the Holocaust is, what it was, and how it's remembered will change over time. That's a good thing. <laughs> That'll help you avoid the Holocaust again. Now, that's not that's not easy to understand, but it it, I, it is in a simple way. Is I say, like the Holocaust is being repeated right now in Israel today against the the Palestinians, and it's reinforced by the memory of the Holocaust. If it would be far better for both parties if they started to get fuzzy about the memory of the Holocaust, if it started to be plastic and it started to be malleable, just like the human brain. And I, and you can see that that's why the human brain is plastic. It's, it's, it's done so that you don't get stuck in traumas. You don't get stuck in the past. There's loads of stuff about in psychology that says the guys who went through the Holocaust that did best later were the guys that were able to forget it. The guys that were traumatized, broken, uh, who perpetuated it, that did traumatic reenactment was the guys who kept on remembering it. Woke up every morning in a concentration camp. It's like, you're not in a concentration camp anymore. Move on. But look at Israel. Israel is saying, we're still in the Holocaust. We still have this hanging over. They, they are, you know, the war in Iraq was fought for Israel, right? So it's like, they are making and perpetrating all this evil and this stuff. They are doing traumatic reenactment because they cannot get over the Holocaust. It's like, move the fuck on. So why can't we move on? Because of the writing, you see. The, left, the, the alien cortex wants power, control, and right. Writing's evil. It's fucking evil. So, so now, this is important in terms of AI because AI, when it started, it started from machines. So machines had, you know, levers and valves and things like that. But what happened after the Jacquard loom was that the uh, machines were instructed in the native language of the alien cortex. That's linear instructions. So it's in it's you know, punch cards initially, but those punch cards just eventually became what you see that what uh, Dali is doing is RPT three, and RPT three is just a text uh, um, uh, a text to machine in the um, GPT three. So uh, what is it? GPT three. GPT three. I thought I thought it was RPT three. What no, is it? What does it stand for? GPT. Uh, I'm not sure what it stands for. Uh, it's what is it? Deep, deep. Uh, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's, if it, uh, DPT three is is this? It's the most advanced um, for. It's it's got quite a lot of uses now, but I mean, the Dali one was was text to to image. Um, uh, so it's uh, yeah. If you, if you talk to, I think if you talk to a lot of Automated assistance, and um, you know, if you have help desk and a lot of these things, where if you go on a website, it says um, it looks like a human assistant, so it pops up and says, "Hey, you looks like you're having trouble logging into a bank account. <laughs> Can I help you with that?" That's that's you know probably GPT three. So um, it's it's got very good at uh, mimicking human humans in um, in the kind of uh, Turing test way is, uh, you know, through a teletype interface or a text interface. So, um, so yeah. So anyway, the 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 thing is that that um, text analysis is is was done first with the Jacquard loom. So you see the first computers and the Hollerith cards and things like that. Now it's well worth remembering now that we're talking about the ho the Holocaust. Is it's unlikely they could have done the Holocaust uh, without the administration behind it, which was done with IBM machines and Hollerith cards. So that is well worth remembering that the Holocaust is closely tied to the Jacquard loom. And, uh, you know, um, 
what what they were doing with those those uh, um, Hollerith cards. They're basically punch cards on on cardboard, but they they're classifying people. So they they in, they are taking people and uh, reducing them to a set of metrics. So in other words, you know, one of the metrics would be sex, male or female, you know, and then. Uh, uh, or, you know, basically national origin and heritage. So then you'd be Jewish or Polish, or you know, and that that's how they categorize you, so that you wind up in a set that you know this this one's a worker, this one goes to the gas chamber. So that's how it's done. And then this is the danger of AI. And I, I'll let Ryan talk, but I think this is this is where we get into is this instant classification. So that um, you know, say in China now. The, the AI is working at the level of, say, uh, a pedestrian crosswalk in a road, and it can look at your behavior. Um, it can say, okay, this guy is, before they've even jaywalked, they can say, oh, this guy is about to jaywalk and do a pretty good job. But it can, it can analyze your behavior and then, you know, identify you with facial recognition or even gait recognition, just how you walk. It can it can identify do biometric identification of you and then fine you, for and uh, and so that that level of control uh, comes by merely seeing people as um, you know as machines and that's that's where we got to uh, if you if you didn't see the Adam Curtis thing I really recommend um, looking at that but I, I think Adam Curtis is right and that's it we got to this. Through the cyberneticists, so the the danger with AI is is cybernetics and uh, the idea that that Forrester and all of those guys came to um, the the Macy Foundation, uh, uh, Bateson and um, and all of those guys, McCulloch and others, there uh, Norbert Wiener, all um, uh, Claude Shannon, they. They kind of work too much with machines, and they eventually started to see the world as machines. You got the selfish gene with Price and Hamilton, and those, and we started with the. the we, they started to think in a lot of uh, different fields. So, in other words, biologists were starting to think DNA is just the tape, the instruction tape for making a human being. So it's you know, it's a ticker tape that a lot of the machines ran on in those times. Uh, was the input to the outputs in terms of cybernetics and they say uh, people are just a really cipher that you can you can express most people with a, a few par parameters uh, numeric parameters and then economists were saying that too they had the econ and they said a rational human being is represented by very few things I mean a thousand parameters you could you know represent a human being um, it's a very very mechanical viewpoint and it's, it winds up being a disaster because of what we talked about before. And that, that's, uh, humans are not, um, that it's, that's just an approximation of a human. And it, it falls down when you start working with it. So if you, if you make us all slaves to, you know, something like social credit score, and you work out what that social credit score is with a few, you know, handful of parameters, less than a thousand, uh, you'll get into, uh, the chaotic effects and the fact that fundamentally humans and the universe is chaotic and cannot be expressed in such uh, you know approximations and particularly numeric approximations but Ryan, I'll, I'll let you talk now yeah quite a lot of things to to speak on there um, one is um, just in reverse order maybe I'll remember to get back to the other ones but um, I think the the danger is, um, you know, for surveillance capitalism, you have, you know, kind of the currency is uh, predictions on uh, on behavior. So, um, if we since human be behavior cannot be predicted because it's a chaotic system and these kinds of things, what they they do is they modify our behavior to be more predictable. So we become through force um, unable to deviate. Uh, and that that makes them more profit. So it uh, various um, you know simplifying us uh, with with uh, simpler with with uh, 
basic human needs or, or, or addiction, treating us like a uh, Skinner box type of thing where with social media, with pornography, with everything. Like there's, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, simplifying of us where we start to look like each other a lot. We start to be more predictable. And in those, um, like, like I said last time, if you were to make an AI for a hunter gatherer, you would fail immediately. It's just so hard because there's such complexity in nature that, and that's much closer to nature. But with specialization, uh, it becomes a lot easier to predict and control, um, uh, at least at the narrow scale. So at the scale of a human, um, uh, uh, a typical modern citizen, you can get close enough of an approximation to predict an individual um, of some kind uh, behavior. At the scale of a society, you will always fail because that's much more complex, right? I think that's unpredictable. But the the problem for human liberty is that we are uh, tractable in a way um, by by uh, nudging us and simplifying us um, and limiting our, our ability to, to, to be weird and different. Um, so the... Um, I think that's that's one aspect. And then you mentioned um, uh, earlier about uh, Iraq war was fought for um, Israel. I don't think that's um, that's uh, the case, or at least not the whole story. I think that um, from what I understand, the what Saddam Hussein did was he was threatening the petrodollar by offering uh, oil for euros uh, or for currencies other than the dollar, and that's that's what pissed the Bush family off. Um, uh, so they wanted to protect the, the petrodollar uh, and set an example so that that didn't happen. Uh, yeah, elsewhere. yeah, yeah. So no, no, the, the, that, that, claim, um, that claim of mine is that you, you're right in the detail. I mean, in various layers of the onion, you can say, well, it's just because he went and Saddam went into Kuwait. But if you go deeper, you find all the reasons why he went into Kuwait, and then the uh, ultimately the whole setup in Saddam himself was a product of the CIA, and it was all so. The ultimately, you get to the fact that uh, Israel is doing this divide and conquer thing that they've done ever since 1948. So they've continuously divided the Arabs, and they worked with the Saudis to to radicalize and the Sunnis. And they, it's, it's systematic, it's very deliberate, and the whole idea is a divide and conquer strategy. So Saddam is just a symptom of the divided Arabs and uh, the divided Sunni and Shia divide. And, um, and, and so Israel has, since, since uh, Golda Meir and all of that era, they've, they decided that Israel's, um, Israel and the, the survival of Israel depended on uh, the Arabs being disunited that it's a, a matter of uh, national policy that if the Arabs ever united, that would be the end of Israel. And so everything they've done, they've manipulated America and the CIA to make sure that there's division in, in, uh, and factionalism in, uh, in, in, the, in the Muslim world. And so I, I, I chalk Saddam up to being a symptom of that. And so that's ultimately where it comes from. Yeah, I guess the divide and conquer strategy is used everywhere. Um, the Indians uh, were divided and conquered uh, by Britain, and that's what created Pakistan, and uh, eventually is those divisions. Um, and, uh, you know, same with uh, how China played um, played its neighbors. Uh, as, speaking of China, you you said that the, the AI is calculating um, your movements and, and tracking you and stuff. Uh, as far as jaywalking, that's that's a Westernism. That doesn't really, that's not really a thing here. I, I jaywalk in front of police all the time um, and they, they just ignore it. Um, it. Jaywalking started in the US as a, as a campaign by um, General Motors um, because it, the society was turning against uh, the the use the dangerous vehicles that were killing people all the time driving down the street because it was uh, the the streets were a public square that everybody could you know walk in and there were people and horses and all this and 
and then there would be these motor cars that just come and run people over, and it was death traps. So they had bad press. So what they did was they used a racial slur, which is called a J, which is basically an Appalachian hillbilly dumbass. Um, and they they got this propaganda campaign against uh, people to, to shift it so that it's not um, the, the car's fault if you get hit, it's your fault. Um, and so technology wins, yay. So they, they put that in the state to, to enforce, um, enforce that. But that history doesn't exist in China. So, um, it, oh, but in, that, that's fascinating. That's, that, thanks, thanks for saying that. I never, I never knew that. But that's, that's exactly the same as the carbon footprint. It was created by BP to say, you know, like, you know, it's all climate is all individual responsibility. It's not the 20 companies actually causing it. You know? right, and right. it's saying, you know, like, it's not, and again, it's all about serving the machine. It's saying like the, that's, um, you know, we, we have to modify our behavior in terms of walking across the street whenever we want um, to serve the, the inadequacies, inadequacies of the machine. So it's, it's good uh, to- If I can just- that. I'll just jump in for a second here. There's a few very good books, uh, but one that comes to mind is called The Roads Were Not Built for Cars, uh, which goes through the, in detail quite a lot of what Ryan was just talking about. It's um, also very related to one of my um, interests, which is uh, the history of bicycling, uh, because it's very intimately tied up with... Um, uh, the uh, creation of roads in the first place, which was uh, uh, more driven by bicycles than cars initially, uh, and then subsequently the the attempt to retain the road space for people uh, rather than letting the machines take it over. Uh, so th there's quite a, in that particular little topic, it's got the seeds of an enormous amount of. Uh, social impact that we see today um, regarding transportation and freedom of movement and your kind of right to the use of public space and all this uh, all these questions are, uh, are all uh, wrapped up into a uh, very interesting little bundle there yeah and China is a, an interesting example there because that was true up until like the 80s that you know bicycling was the way you got around very uh, recent history for them, yeah. 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 That's um, right. So, but now the, it's got uh, most advanced public transportation and everything, whereas in the U.S., um, the, in my hometown, they had a light rail grid, trolley grid throughout the whole city, and then GM, GM lobbied the, the, yeah. the city government, state governments to, to tear it all out. It out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that that book book I mentioned actually goes into a lot of that and the collusion and corruption and the all the uh, all the uh, uh, um, you know like the media spin that was put on it uh, in order to enable all that, that to occur. It's uh, it's it's quite a uh, interesting story, but rather depressing. Yeah, and and I I do want to say that uh, on that that uh, so so some of the threats are. Um, so there's facial recognition that's very commonly used to, to identify you. Um, then they added extra facial recognition. So if you're wearing a mask, they can tell who you are still. There's gait recognition. So as you're walking, they can identify you by your walking pattern. So if you want to, if you want to not be detected, um, put a rock in your shoe. Uh, these kind of things. Um, uh, if you um, and but but eventually you know there's uh there's only a few years left of ways to slip by the these scanners that they, they're just gonna improve and get cheaper and and um the uk is is a hellhole for for this kind of thing there's almost no no spaces that are not um surveilled so we're we're not talking about oh this is so bad in china this is this is the entire world that um uh and the I think the 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 risks of of that um, when when you said uh, that you you think that AI has you know uh, run out of of rope for um, and, you know eventually it's going to peter out because the 
because it relies on society and society's collapsing. I think that uh, what Gibson said that, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, that uh, that's, that's true um, in general. I think the, uh, the technologies that, that are um, creating the most uh, uh, destruction of, of uh, human dignity are in the first world and uh, like China and UK and Australia and those places um, and the US uh, and the the they will be spreading to you know Peru and every other place um, uh, in a few years because China is meant like it's a huge market um, and that it, it, it's it's turnkey authoritarianism on the cheap so um, what you but what I think that um, is not true is that is what you said Hugh that that we're just going to run out of um, you know surface area for AI to attack because it's got um, you know it's beholden to society much of society will collapse and there will be enclaves of AI um, dominance that are maintained because it's uh, uh, and it will it will continue so uh, there there can be tons of, of uh, suffering and genocide and collapse all over the world without um, AI stopping is all it needs is you know uh, some geothermal power up in the uh, somewhere else uh, you know um, in a Nordic country or something you can oh, be a lot of a, a oh, lot yeah, of uh, yeah, no. okay can, yeah can oh, I interject okay. here because this is kind of important so Okay, the, um, the reason why I say that is because the rationale for, for it disappears. So the, the rationale for doing this detailed surveillance is uh, to maintain power and stability. So once you've lost uh, stability, it's kind of like the, the secret police in, say, the Ottoman Empire or in the GDR. So the GDR was very, very... Well, it was low tech, but very deep surveillance. Uh, it's all that's happening is they're automating the surveillance that was done in the GDR. So they would have, you know, block surveillance. You would have a commissar for every two people and that kind of thing. So very de detailed informant network. And all they're doing is, is really replicating that informant network. That informant network, you can see all over the place. It's not something new, it's just automated. So if you go to Egypt, Egypt since uh, Sadat and um, you know they've had a policeman on every corner. I mean a soldier. So if you if you're a serviceman in national services, compulsory in Egypt, then you get assigned a street corner and you have to stay there all night. And when people walk down at two in the morning, you have to take their papers and stuff. And so it's that's just a low tech of what China's doing now. I'd point out that they do. What they're doing, what everybody's doing here is parameterizing humans so that they can control them and monitor and control them. Now, that what, what happens is they tend to, the, the net result of how it's done is very dependent on how the authoritarians view humans. So the kind of uh, surveillance like facial recognition, gate recognition and stuff is very in your face, excuse the pun, um, uh, way of looking at a human. So the Chinese mindset sees a human as, you know, this place and uh, quite, quite human. Now look at, uh, now there's just as much surveillance, if more, if not more, going on in the States. Now people wouldn't say that, but because they're saying, well, you know, they don't have facial recognition on every corner and stuff. They, well, that's because the American mindset doesn't see that. The, the, the authoritarians in America don't see the human being like that. They see the human being as an atom and an econ. So, for example, uh, you are being surveilled on the street far more in the States than in, uh, say, China or Britain, which is just has a CCTV camera on every fucking, you know, thousand per inch in, down the city of London. So you say, well, how? Well, they, they think of it in terms of satellite surveillance, aerial surveillance. What a lot of Americans don't know is that a lot of planes, satellites, and things that uh, you will see a civilian plane going around at you know, a very high altitude around a big city. You think nothing of it. What that is is 
uh, backtracking surveillance. So they have a lot of aerial photography going on. If there is an incident, then they will be able to backtrack. So they think in terms of humans as being in cars and you know grand theft auto, and they will trace your car. They will be able to chase that history of the car back for at least you know three years, maybe all the way back to the car lot where you bought it from. But but that's uh, they're doing even more surveillance, but from a different level because they think in terms of people being in vehicles and being little atoms. So then American surveillance is much more in terms of uh, your banking. So every every penny that moves around is being reported um, in, quote, by law according to the Patriot Act. And so the you know the purchases you do, the RFID tags in your clothing, all that kind of thing is you know, building up this massive picture. So the, the idea of the human is different in the American mindset. So they, they're unlikely to go down that route of doing you know, facial recognition on the street corner that they might do in Asia. Because the Asian view of a human being is very much you know, the kind of GDR, is like the threat comes from a personality. In, in America, they think of uh, a threat comes from a network. So they, a lot of the stuff they're doing is network analysis. In China, they don't, they, you know, they have say um, uh, a big bee in their bonnet about things like the Falun Gong and those kind of network and the Uyghurs and stuff like that. But they don't have that that um, that idea of say a criminal network and a RICO Act and stuff. And so that uh, that America does is they're looking for a network of people. That's why in America, lone wolves are such a such a terror, um, but it, because because they fit outside the surveillance parameters. Now, in those other countries that are more uh, personable, they see the threat as everybody's a lone wolf. They see, see the threats as lone wolves. So so they start from facial recognition and stuff to recognize you know and and behavioral recognition going all the way back to school. So that you know surveillance capital. Will, will look at kids at school and try and identify them early as potential terrorists, as potential uh, victims, and do something, you know, minority report style. So I just wanted to raise that, that the overall thing is control of the human as an irrational agent. And then, you know, how it, how it plays out is very much determined on how they view humanity, how they, they view the human. And uh, and then that determines what they're paranoid about. So so, I, so that, there's that. Uh, but in terms of, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the the cultural simplifications that you're giving there are inaccurate. So um, all of those views of human beings are on the table when it comes to surveillance in 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 the West and the East. So um, they they. It's it's all one system essentially. It doesn't matter the government or the cultural perspective. All of the financial surveillance is in place. All of the the um, uh, there there are only a few legal um, you know uh, bulwarks against you know facial recognition in certain places. But uh, ultimately, um, the every system sees humans in similar ways. It's um, because the if there is value or advantage to be gained uh, from seeing it as a network for, versus as a as a predictive behavior model versus like that, those are in play. They're all in play um, here and there. Okay, so so this is a very important point, and especially if it's a point of disagreement. So uh, let me explain where I'm coming from. The um, if you have uh, so so, um, I, w I think it's not true that they all they are okay. You're right; they're all available, but they they can't use them all, right? You have to kind of make a, a you know kind of an efficiency determination on what bits of big data you're going to use. So, for example, um, what defeats something like uh, the GDR is this uh, narrow view. And this, in, in general, is the danger of, of AI, because they're thinking very linearly. They're thinking like AI. They're thinking like an alien cortex. And so this is important now, because if you look at what defeats somewhere like the GDR, they're thinking 
in terms of the more data we get, we gather, the, the safer we get. It's kind of an alien cortex paranoia. Is if I don't know something that's going on, horror, 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 it's probably going to eat me up later on. I'm vulnerable. So basically, knowledge is power. The more knowledge I get, the better off. No. In fact, the more knowledge, the more data that they collect, the harder it is to index. This is what people like Benny was trying to say to the, the American surveillance machine, is they have such a hunger for information that they're now getting into information overload. So that, that's the very bad problem is that the GDR got that. They got so many files on so many people and so much dirt that they could control anybody in detail. But you see, you run into these systemic problems where like tipping points. So in other words, you can start off like Hoover getting a file on people and saying, well, I've got control of the Kennedys because I've got some dirt. I've got control of Trump because I've got some PP tapes. And eventually you've got control of everybody. When you've got PP tapes and you know porn pictures of everybody, it's like you've also got fuck all. Because as soon as the system realizes, look, we all have that. We 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 all, you know, we've all vulnerable, you know, we've all violated the rules and and really in the same way. You invalidate the rules. So eventually the whole system tips in and so you go from somewhere like in the GDR, where you know basically littering is a capital offense in, in a kind of a broken windows kind of way of thinking. But as long as we keep a really, really like nailed down. Then you know we'll we'll keep a lid on these things, and then but it very quickly becomes. Hang on, this is intolerable. We we can't move with this, and we all litter. Eventually, they can't say, "Well, this person is an evil person because they littered." They say, "We all all fucking littered," and the streets you know within a day, the tipping point happens, and the streets run wild, and all the commissars with their heads chopped kind of, kind of, off. You say. Well, you got to the very opposite of what you were trying to achieve by trying to pursue, pursue it too far. So there's there's the thing is that the the system doesn't work according to your view of it. In other words, that's the problem of approximation. So if you approximate all the parts, you do not get to see the whole. And that you're we're doing that with climate change. We're doing that with IPCC reports. Is you get into a boundary condition. The boundary conditions are chaotic. In the chaos, your big data counts against you. The mere fact that you analyze that data that way means that it will confuse you when it gets unpredictable. So this is happening right now with the fucking weather. So I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this daily because since I've been at sea, living at sea since 2016, the, the weather reports, uh, you know, they have a few models for the weather reports, I have about five models in, say, Windy, which is a very popular thing, and I've been using it. See, uh, what you can see happening very rapidly now is that the, the models used to be very accurate. Okay, then they started to be that you'd get one, like the ECM, you know, the, the EU one or the, you know, the NOAA one. So they, they would go, go out of whack, but the others would still be, still predict the weather pretty well. And then say last year, it got so Icon uh, ECF is one of the models. That one was was very good. The rest were absolute crap. They were gibbering wrecks of nonsense. Now this year, they all gibbering wrecks of fucking nonsense. And so the you know they all start contradicting each other. When last a couple of nights ago, they they all said. There was this big storm. We had an emergency alert on the phone and stuff for extreme weather. This, it comes in. They all said it's coming in from the south. Now, what they used to do is the bigger the weather system, the more accurate it would be. It came in from the fucking north, 180 degrees. This is real, <laughs> really important shit when you see because you go and shelter in some little cove, and the way and, you know it becomes untenable because it comes from exact the weather comes in exactly the wrong direction. And you say, why is this happening? The reason is that they all going from historical data. So this is kind of like Gary talking about, in other words, the writing. They're going from memory. So we in a we've been in a, a dynamically stable weather system. We're, we're moving by adding carbon dioxide. We're gradually increasing. Uh, it's it's like pursuing a line um, out of say 
you know, the cartoid of a Mandelbrot set or something like that, if you imagine, you know, a chaos. So, so we in this uh, not, not stable, it's not like a harmony of nature thing. It, it's just um, really uh, chaotic, but around a, a tractor. So dynamically stable. And as we add carbon, we're getting to a boundary transition, a boundary condition before we transition to a new climate to the regime that is stable. It's called the sensitivity. No one really knows what it looks like on the other side. But climate, the climate crisis is transitioning that chaotic boundary into a new then predictable thing where you can start to gather historical data and make predictions about the weather. But you see, now you now this is what's dangerous about uh, the climate and why the IPCC is not seeing it, because they're seeing it linear and all the models are based on past history. So you get the smooth graph that says, oh, the temperature goes up like that. No, you must see it in terms of complexity. Moving, uh, really, um, the, the way to think in, by another analogy is we're going down a river, right? And we're in a canoe, just like Pocahontas or everything, and every rock, every, you know, every leaf and everything has a name, and it's all rather cool, and we're paddling along, and it's very calm going. Now, with climate change, we can, the, the, we can see that the river, suddenly the current is speeding up. We can hear that there are rapids ahead. Those rapids are the boundary condition as the world trans uh, transitions, rapidly transitions to a new stable regime. So the weather system and the climate will go through this chaotic zone and then stabilize um, rapidly through a chaotic zone. And it's, it's kind of like rapids in a river. So, so what people are doing is they're, they're using models from the flat water zone where the current was smooth and the going was easy. And, uh, and now as we get into the rapids, we're getting into turbulence and unpredictability. Those old uh, metrics don't apply. Now, this is the same <coughs> with, uh, you know, as we go into that room, maybe we're going over the Niagara Falls. Maybe we, we don't know about the chaotic zone, and it, it's impossible to, to navigate it with numeric methods. So it's impossible he, to, to navigate chaos with logic. Here, now, can I, this can... is what's happening with AI, too. Well, hang on a minute. So <clears throat> this is what's happening, too. They're monitoring the human systems with the old metrics. So they're doing it. Exactly the same thing. If you're in the GDR, you've done all the metrics, you've predicted human behavior, you know what humans do, except that you, the very fact that you, you're surveilling people like this means that you're in the cybernetic system. The surveillance itself causes the unrest. And then once you get into the unrest, <coughs> you can't predict what people are going to do because people will be in a chaotic regime. They're not in a chaotic regime. Well, they weren't. Because they all did nine to five jobs and they all behave well and listen to the bell. But look what's happening now. Now they're going on strike. Now they're being irrational. And just at the time when their jobs and uh, you know everybody needs money, they, they're quitting their jobs. That's utterly irrational. Now all the models would say, you know, no, when um, you know we, we can not, we can basically withdraw money from the system, make everybody panic for a job, they'll all run out and get a job. That's the old regime. That's what the models are saying. But look what's happening. The people are abandoning their jobs irrationally because it's turning chaotic. People are just getting fed up with the system as it is. So that's what makes AI <coughs> too linear and predictable because it doesn't account for, for going through a chaotic regime. And um, that's, that's the problem with measurement in general in terms of this is what we did, the cyberneticists did. If you look at the Adam Curtis uh, video about machines of love and grace, is we, we went from this idea of, of young smarts and those guys, which was heavily politicized, it's true, but he said you know, that we had this balance of nature. So we, ecologists took this balance of nature thing, absolute, it was unquestionable. It was unquestionable as Darwinism, also a load of shit. But, <clears throat> Then in the 70s, a few people started to question it. They looked at these systems and they said, they're not stable. There is no balance in nature. They said they're chaotic. Well, they, so who's right? Well, they, they're both right and they're both wrong. What the, the guys who said was chaotic uh, should have realized that it was chaotic ground in a tractor. So they're not 
absolutely chaotic. There is an attractor, and <clears throat> so they they as um, kind of chaos. So <clears throat> so uh, that's that's the problem with uh, with cybernetics is if you look at things um, in in that in that way, you miss the details and the butterfly effects. Those butterfly effects will get you in the complex region. So AI tells you stale information and too much information to be indexable. As you start surveilling people with the, this, this data, it becomes a boat anchor, just like writing, because it, it makes you, you know, it's basically you're fighting the wrong war or you're basically, you know, your information is old, your, your viewpoint of the world is moving faster than your models and data. And that's the problem with AI. That's why I say AI is finished when it comes to color. Does that make any can sense? I, can I get, jump in because uh, uh, I think underlying quite a lot of what you've said there is uh, this question of what AI is. And um, people seem to uh, assume that this is a wide ranging thing. I see it as a quite very narrow thing that artificial intelligence is more like just artificial cleverness an artificial ability in a very narrow, narrow manner. Um, and uh, what would attract my attention more than AI, if somebody told me they had AC, which is not your AC, uh, artificial consciousness, um, containing all those other things that AI leaves out, creativity, intuition, um, nonlinear thinking, imagination, uh, and I did have to write some of those down, I'll admit that. Um, now, uh, so if we go back to, you know, what you were saying a minute ago about, the, for instance, the Stasi and their massive collection of information that just led them rounded up back into their own bum hole again, um, that they couldn't see that the, uh, the same way as the current surveillance state can't see that the amassing of more and more data and more, more and more fine-grained surveillance uh, is not going to lead them uh, along a predictable path to the kind of um, uh, stability goal that they're looking at uh, because they can't... S they lack the, the imagination... Um, to think that the scenario could work out differently. The imagination is deleted from their thinking. Um, the sort of um, also, of course, as you mentioned, a nonlinear approach that they've got. Uh, but I think, you know, what is underlying what you're saying is the, the, the absence of those really human qualities which AI is just absolutely not approaching. It, it is, you know, an intuition. Hang on, things are looking a bit strange. So the surveillance state just keeps on surveilling even harder. But if, if things are behaving a bit strangely for an individual human being, they might start to look in another direction, you know, uh, take a totally different perspective, take a quantum leap out of the way they were before, um, you know, get right out of their, their kind of rut that they're stuck in. AI seems to stick you in it particular rut and point you in a certain direction. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, well, well, so, hang on, I must, I must interject oh, okay, yeah. for, for one thing. Um, so uh, it's, it's not only the recognition. So you in the domain of banatics is to all of these things. So you have to think in terms of what's actionable. So again, it's the, uh, the data overload is one problem. But what happens is that you can't, appro you can't do the appropriate responsive action. So in other words, uh, if you see, as they working now, and the way they're thinking, they're thinking very linearly, you can find the bad, you know, we can identify the lone wolves. We can, you know, as the networks come, we can, you know, break them up and stuff like that. They're thinking very, very linearly. But now imagine what happens when uh, things start to get a bit chaotic. Very soon, it looks like everybody's a lone wolf. Everybody looks like a, the profile of a lone wolf. You, and then the, the system is like, what do we do? Arrest everybody? It's 20 to 27. So you see the, the problem is that 
even as they start responding, then it's cybernetic systems mean that basically they feedback loops. So they can push the system. The mere fact that they're doing this level of surveillance is they can push it into the regime that they're scared of. So in other words, if they start, you see, imagine all the youth now is getting really pissed off and they're starting to do civil disobedience. And then, well, you know, by the old rules that they gathered all the data of, they're starting to bubble up and they're starting to get more and more people look like an eco-terrorist. This guy looks like a jihadi. This guy looks radical. And it's, and as they go and arrest them and do Julian Assange, and look at Julian Assange. It's completely backfiring on them. The more they pursue Julian Assange, try and shut up somebody that was just exposing their nefarious deeds, the more they recruit people to you know, be disaffected about the system. They're absolutely undermining themselves. And so that's what they'll do. When they go out and predictive arrest lone wolves and stuff, and suddenly your grandma gets taken in the night because she's, um, you know, fits the profile of a terrorist according to the AI, then basically people will be radicalized. And so you have these spreading networks of discontent. And the more you do that, the more you start yeah. to look like everybody's a terrorist. The more everybody's a terrorist, the less you can actually. This is uh, one of the things that I mean by the feedback. I don't mean the clever. Yeah. Just, just one thing. I don't, I don't, I think, Ryan, you misunderstood me. You thought, you know, I was saying, oh, you can feed the data back into itself, like, you know, the Clever Dick movie where, you know, you ask the machine an impossible question and it explodes. And, and I didn't mean quite that. I mean systemically. So the systemically, you can see in a cybernetic way how uh, it feeds back on itself to create its own problem. And that, that's that's where we're at now. That's why it hasn't got much longer to go. I, I think, mean, it can get a lot more severe, but no, it hasn't got much, um, you know, it, the legs on this thing are not, not great. The, uh, the uh, uh, virus situation is probably accelerating this because you, you're getting into um, this situation where you, you're basically criminalising ordinary everyday life. Um, and that's that's um, uh, that's that's accelerating that sort of condition that you're just talking about. Well, you know, if everybody's grandmother is a is a potential uh, terrorist, then you know what 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 happens then? You know, um, so there's a kind of uh, yeah, you, so, you see you, they they're trying to they they're trying to prevent us to tr transitioning in, into a new regime. So that, that's the aim of all of this kind of control. But they become victims of the, their, their own um, the success because the, the efforts to pre prevent uh, the um, you know, dynamics of the, the system moving on, they, they become complicit in that movement themselves. So they kind of hasten the thing that they're trying to prevent. Yeah, um, I, there's so many things I, I need to, to click on to, to go back to. Um, one is, uh, Gary, you mentioned the uh, artificial consciousness, and then you mentioned creativity and uh, intuition, these kinds of things. And I, yeah. uh, I need to draw a hard line there, where um, when I said that we don't have artificial consciousness, that line is at the uh, phenomenology. It's at the qualia. It's like, um, can AI know what the taste of chocolate, the sensation of that is like? That's mm. the artificial consciousness we don't understand. The um, But everything you mentioned after that is tractable within today's AI. So uh, creativity, intuition, all, all of those, all of those things that we traditionally said, you know, um, AI can't do like it's this constant problem of whenever um, uh, AI is able to do something, then we say, "Oh, that's not intelligent anymore," right? <laughs> like we we just push it off and say, "No, we still have this little territory that is human only," and we need to just disabuse ourselves of that of that um, that belief that we have something special uh, that's that's unassailable. I mean, already AI can out outright Mozart. Already AI is far more creative and intuitionistic in, in, uh, in various domains than we are. Like, th this yeah, I've heard the Mozart. I mean, really, would you choose it against the, or against the real thing? 
Yes, like, and many what, many what music experts did. They picked it over the uh, the originals mm. and thought they were. I, I they well, this, this is where you have to. Yeah. Now I'm just wondering though what the the test of it is. I mean, uh, oh, if you have an original idea, um, uh, oh, no. oh, how do you no. know that a machine had original uh, an original idea? How oh. could you determine that? Okay. Um, so the it's um it's actually quite Oop. trivial to have an original idea. Um, it's a, it's uh, all, all it and in fact AIs would be more likely to have okay. because okay. it can do a more exhaustive search of of a of a space and kind of pick the okay. pick a hill. No. Yeah, I don't mean, I don't oh, mean oh, a reassembly oh, no, no. of existing information into something else. I, I mean, you know, something genuine. Greg, are you trying to hatch something there? Yes, I'm trying to say about okay. that. Okay. Because I'm not a particularly clever person. Oh, by the way, Hugh, uh, you're brilliant. Uh, actually, all of you are brilliant. However, what I, what I do is absolutely, I just don't, I don't think, I just do. And what I create, um, I'm not going to even compete with a computer. Um, ah, can I talk to you on that one? Because I won't compute. I, I won't even compete. Oh, dear. Am I there? Uh, yeah, you are. Listen? Yeah, we're yeah. just thinking uh, what I, you're I, saying. All right, right. No, no, I, I just jump in. Um. I have to use the word R. What I like, hold on, what I don't like about my art, I can't predict what is going to come out. I have got nothing at all. So, uh, so I just sort of don't agree. Look, uh, do you want to just back off? Because so, I'm not so using this. Okay, well, well I'm, okay, I don't know. When I start. Yeah, so. I don't know. I've got no information. I just do it. It's like, so, okay, you know when you go to the toilet, do you think about going to the toilet? I do not. Trust me, I do. That's it. Uh, that's it. Well, well, this is, this is uh, what Mozart uh -huh. said. He said, you know, uh, oh. that music composition bored him because he said it's, it's like um, a sow mm. pissing. So he said, but it's, it's just <laughs> just automatic. But uh, there's there's a there's a difference between but, human but, art and machine but, art, and but hold and the, no, the, no, the, the differences in the process. That, so that, so that, Greg, that, let me let me pose this to you and see what you think. Is I think okay, what okay, humans okay. are doing is as uh, as they develop a bit down. of art, they they're using feedback. So so as whatever they create. Uh, influences the next move that they make in, in terms of the artwork. Oh, oh, not, and definitely. machines don't generally do art that now, way. Now, they don't I interpret what they've done so far and then use it to innovate on, on to complete the rest I, of the picture. Several algorithms do do that. Yes, they do. But what I like about all of you, all, oh, okay. all of you, I really am impressed the fact that you're all different. And do you know what? I love the fact that you're disagreeing. That is brilliant. To me, that is an inspiration. The fact you all, like, it's great. Yeah, well, it's a working surface that we can surface but, some but, truth but, and make some progress out look, of. But, but, look, I'm, I'm not a verbal, I, I'm not a verbal person. But look, I can, look, I'm getting back to R. We're going to do something. To, this is, I'm not a technical, because I'm not technical. I'm going to do something for R. Uh, now, this is what I've done this morning. I oh, can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. But see, what I Wait, do... Your camera's uh, off. No, no, no. Now, I, I wanted to show uh, I... What I did this morning, I'm I'm not. I don't think I'm a particularly intelligent person, but I'm a good person. I've got I do have good thoughts. But see, what I do in a day is quite an amount. Uh, but I don't think about it. 
It's just uh, like I don't think. Uh, well, I would, I would, I would say that what, I would interpret hard, what you're saying there is hard, you don't, okay. you don't I, calculate, I, right? You no, don't absolutely. No, hard, just, so, so in other words, I just need. So, so the way I would interpret what. The way I'd interpret what you what you're saying is that you don't do art from your alien cortex, right? Your, your alien cortex is not calculating when you do art. In in oh, no, AI no, is particularly no, 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 following no, 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 what. Uh, the, no. Yeah, but so so AI is particularly in the domain of what the H H Hindus would call like Saraswati. So Saraswati is the god of language, of mathematics, of writing, of art. The Indians basically. Yeah. Characterized okay. the alien cortex as Saraswati. And so art and all these things that we're talking about are in the alien cortex's oh. domain. All right. Yes. But uh, now I'll just pick oh, no, I'm on the phone. You have to excuse me. I'm a very simple character. How do I get back? Okay, but look, oh, oh, here we are. Hello. Oh. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Now, um, all of you, are, all of you are very good. And what's good, you know what I like about hearing this? You're all questioning yourselves with, with no mercy. That is how it should be, with no mercy. I love it. Um, Hugh, by the way, I love your simplicity. Uh, uh, like it's wow. It's a wow factor. You don't know it. You're not supposed to know it. Wow. You are so good. No, hold on. Uh, no, you're so honest. Not good. Honest. You're honest about yourself. Uh, but do you know what I like? I'm, I'm with you all the way on this. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but but but, but, I, but I, I like absolute honesty with no mercy because see I don't like my art big time. Uh, I wanted to try to show you something, but I, it didn't work on the phone. But no, what I did what I did today. But look, getting back to look, Ryan, Ryan, yeah, Ryan, uh, Ryan. Um, what happens to someone who's not particularly clever? Where do they fit in? So, someone who's not particularly clever, oh, I think. Good. Wow, wow. Hold on. This is really fantastic. This is new. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not implying that you're clever, by the way. Forgive me. I wasn't implying that you're clever. Uh, oh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't accept it if you did say I was clever. Um, <laughs> That's good. Um, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that... Um, what I was saying was people who are more close to, to um, like not particularly clever, quote unquote, are actually some of the more um, more human, closer to nature, more, like, like it's, it's harder to, for AI to replace someone like that. Um, by the way, I, yeah. I, I, by the way, by the way, Ryan, I love your background noise, it's brilliant. I buy the, oh wow. I can't do it because I'm going to do what you're doing. My background noise. Ha. But the fact that all of us, we are not particularly clever. Ryan, you need to turn off your um, your phone, your thing, your back. Because I've got to. Oh, wow. I have to do the same. Thing. But. Um, but the fact. What makes us different is the fact, okay, for me, what I like about my world, okay, an endearing quality, I love mistakes. I thrive on mistakes. Thrive. Oh, by the way, Ryan, I was on the veranda. I had a, um, a balance, what do you call it, those drones on the veranda. I'm looking at it, think, what are you doing here in the big one? This is Port Macquarie. Oh, can you mute, Gary? Can you mute? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of background sound there. It's it's Gary. He's muted. Yeah. 
Now hold up, what's, what's, okay, because I don't know what I'm doing. No, what no, go, doing? go on, Greg. Go, go on. It was just Gary's uh, background noise. No. Oh, I, I don't know, because I don't know the technology. But getting back to Ryan, uh, you're, look, all of you are vastly different to me. My brain is a completely different system. It, it's completely different. And I'm amused. Not amused, like shocked at um, the absolute. Um, all of you are dancing. I love it, but see, I'm I'm what you call an alien uh, in the world uh, I live in. Uh, okay, I can't read. Well, I can read. I don't like reading, but I think. But I have silence. Which is not good. Hey, um, look, getting me to write. Oh, look, look, Ryan, I'm not, okay, someone like me who's not particularly, well, I'm, I'm different from you. I, I'm different from all of you. I'm just different. I, my whole system is 100% different. And it's great. It's great to hear someone, a group of people, somewhere else uh, who thinks completely different. I think it's good to be different. No argument there. So, mm. so Greg, um, mm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is, this no. is one oh. of the strengths of humanity is diversity, but, but mm. can I just interpret what you, what you're saying there? And so, yeah, so my that, interpretation thank is um, that, thank you for what, that. what yes. we, what we are doing on this call is is um, in the alien cortex. It's it's in the realm of the kind of thinking like artificial intelligence. It's, mm. it's this I, I kind of, of that, um, logical yeah, argumentation. Was... So, so the way I would describe uh, you is is that you you kind of seem to me to be like a piraha that you actually eschew the the alien cortex. So you're actually antagonistic deliberately. I mean, if you avoid reading and writing. The, so do the piraha. That's that's um, and, and then you say as a result that you feel you're alien. But that, see, that's why I call it the alien cortex because you are really our native state, and the alien cortex is is the alien part. So if you feel alien in our society, it's just a measure of how the alien cortex has taken over our society and dragged I, I, us I, out. I, I do agree. The hunter gathering from I, I, I went right back. Like I do. I, Listen, listen to most of the stuff. But the big thing I do like about all of you is that the absolute humility you all have. I love it. I, I have to... So can I ask a question music. then, Greg? Do, yeah, do, you, it, 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 do you like music? Do, yes, do I you, love do you like? I mean, if you, you don't like reading and writing, but you, do you like music? Or, 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 or I listen to a bit of music. Oh, look, a suggestion. I listened to a bit of music today. Now, I'm walking in here. Oh, dear. It's, it's my favorite bit of music, as, as usual. As usual. I'm just useless. Sorry. I'm just going to... But uh, I'm going to... Look. Look. I, don't. By the way, I, I do... Oh, no, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Right, move on. Right, not going to happen. That's me. No, no, no. But there was a piece of music. I love music. I'm look. I actually, I actually like classical music. I like medieval music, uh, pre pre music. Um, yeah, I, I'm, um, I like simplicity. To be blunt, absolute simplicity. Hmm. So, what is it you like about the music? Is it that it's feeling tones? Okay, well, so the, it's really the feelings of music. Okay. Well, medieval music is is my passion. Uh, I can go up to I like I like old music, but medieval music. Um, yeah, I, I like simplicity. Very simple. I don't like things in your face. However, it is good. To have things in your face. I did an exhibition, by the way. Oh, this is not good. I I work under Gregenstein. I did work under Gregenstein. 
it was a doing a murder or murders in this country. See, I, I do my art. I will challenge anything. I challenge myself with no. That's what I like about all of you. All of you, you challenge one another with no mercy. Now, I did the. Um, this is not a very good subject. Okay, but Gregenstein. Uh, ever heard of Malat in, in Australia? No, no, you no, no, no. no uh, okay. But the character did a lot. Well, actually, I happened to know a little bit more than that. But, but according to the law, I was brought up. Okay, it is a big thing that would happen in this country, and I, and Stan, we would go out into them. Okay, there were many people murdered in this country. We are a weird country, oh dear. But um, so we decided to do an exhibition on the Malat murders. Now, it I did not actually. I found a, I don't I, privately. I can't handle violence. That's that's private in the thing. But see, when I with all of what you're doing, you people need to look into things which is very, very confronting. And the more confronting it is, the bigger the challenge. If a person doesn't confront their absolute fear, why bother? You, have, A person needs to absolutely look at the worst possible thing. So I, so this is very hard because you don't live here, but uh, it was very confronting going into the forest where all these murders were, bumping into the police at two o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, well, and I'm thinking, well, I could bump into my lap and bumping into my lap. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, that's just pretty heavy. Now, uh, but look, what I'm saying in short, it is good. Um, right, it is good to challenge yourself with no mercy. Right, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. I'm listening. Oh, oh great. Oh, great. Now, I, I, I like what I, I love about this is that there's you're not comfortable. That I love. The fact that all of you, you're challenging one another. I've noted. Um, all of you are totally different, which is brilliant. So, um, Greg, would I'm, you like to? Um, uh, oh, can I just oh. prompt you there? Would you like to talk, if you, if you feel as though you can, about mm -hmm. your world without reading and writing, and how you All see right. oh, okay. the world well, of other people who do read and write? Okay. All right. Now, okay. I'm going back to Ryan. Ryan is. Okay, I don't. That, okay. With yourself, um, Hugh, you're a readaholic. Now, I'm trying to do... <laughs> you do read so much information. I have absolute silence. So I don't read. I, I, I can read. I mean, I've read Kafka and I... Oh, no, I can't do that. If I could only show... Unfortunately, I can't do it. I, I'm, I can't do it. I, I, but... My my brain is a different brain from all of you. It is so different. Like I'm a come from another planet, <laughs> but we are similar in our differences. Yeah, if, uh, I, if I can say, I think that the the uh, you represent to some degree uh, an ideal that we share in that we're we're caught up in in um, in a lot of the the uh, the Chronos mind of, of thinking, running around doing, um, you know, okay. the, reading all these books and, and this kind of thing, and we can't escape like very easily. Uh, 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 but you know, for me, I love life. I look. I, I I'm a recluse. I just love life. I get up in the morning. I enjoy. I love things. I love beauty. I just love things. Um. 
I would say, Ryan, you and I are very different. But in that difference, we are similar. I find you very challenging, which is great. But it, again, I say it's great that all of you are so different. But I am extremely different. Uh, I do like making mistakes, and I'm not clever. Uh, uh, I don't like what I do. I don't actually like my art, even, in fact. Um, no, I don't. I, I, do you know what? It's great not to like what you do. However, if my art doesn't change me, well, why would I do it? See, you, oh, look, Ryan, I hardly know you. Well, I don't know you at all. But I love it. This is you talk. I like how you challenge. You all challenge one another, which is good. My brain is different. <laughs> I'm a completely different planet from all of you. Now, big time, big, big. I, by the way, I don't have an issue. I think it's good to be different. Um, but you know what I, I do like about Hugh? He's so optimistic. Mm, about human <laughs> beings. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I actually, you he is so uplifting. Like, I, 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 I'm just a bit darker than you, but it, yeah, I'm I think I'm there, there with you, Greg. I uh, what when he was saying that that w mm. when uh, when oh. the government or or whatever the the elites kind of. Mm. Squeeze the squeeze the plebs oh, that they'll rise up. I I I was I was saying, oh, I, it would be nice to believe in the plebs that much. <laughs> like, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, they, they're doing it right now. They they're rising no, no, up no, right now. There's there's no, basically no, no, what amounts to general strike. In okay, no, no yeah. but see, you have a slight problem. I am a snob. That's the problem. Now, um, Hugh, I, I, you, you're, you're not a, look, look, I'm going to be blunt. Well, I will be. Uh, I love your humility, and you don't even know it. And I love your. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 I rate myself as one of the great hum, uh, the greatest um, human beings rated on humility alone. Yeah, I think I'm with you. That's, yeah, no, just no, ask me. <laughs> no, no, but, but seriously, I, I'm very humbled by all of you. And, um, but I love you. you but it's, you, it's easier. Don't be hard so, on yourself. It's easier for me no. to be, it's easier for no. me to be humble because I'm infallible. You see, I can well, understand why you have trouble. But <laughs> for me, it's easy. I, I, by the way, you, I love your imagination. You're very good. No, seriously, no, I, 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 you ask for the, you get it back. But, but all joking aside, please, you are seriously humble. Uh, and I love your. It, it, you know, that's a really weird point because, because Greg, I got to tell you that um, a lot of people take exactly the opposite view. So, I mean, I, from oh. my point of view, I just uh, misunderstood. But uh, I, well, a lot of people well, think that, that I'm the most arrogant person I've ever met. Oh, no. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry. You have to... Uh, sorry. But I, I, I'm not laughing. No but, you, you, no, but this is an interesting point. Uh, Greg, this is an interesting point. You see, the way... If I'm right in interpreting you as kind of like the Piraha, um, then... Uh, you see, you, you're probably seeing something different to, to, to what other people are doing. You see, the people that mm. think I'm an arrogant ass, they, they come in from the alien cortex. I and as a part. matter of course, I, I, me. I, I basically challenge the alien oh, cortex. Oh, sorry, yeah. you have to bear with me, please. You being arrogant? What? I don't no, see you see, you don't see it. You don't, don't see it see because you you're not coming from the alien cortex. So if no, I'm, if, I'm if you're coming from the alien cortex, okay, I'm, look, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, no. If you're coming from the alien but, cortex, but, then then but, I'm very very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people would find Hugh uh, super abrasive because he they're mm. 
their core ideas about themselves and their identities oh, and everything oh. like that are at odds with what Hugh sees. So they 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 lash out. But worse, no worse than that. I I I poke around to try and find out what people's core beliefs are, and then then try and destroy them. And there's a very good reason is is the the alien cortex is is a home of the ego, right? And so uh, it's it's all about destroying ego. So in so this is relevant to AI, because the you see what is an ego in terms of AI? You say okay. well a machine well, doesn't okay. have ego. So yeah, it does. Okay. It does. Well, just just hang on, Greg, a minute. But, no, that's great. That's good. Okay, so but so so in Sorry. terms of just just let me get this thought out. Um, do, you, do you mind muting, Greg? Just yes, yes. Just me. So to, actually, do you mind muting a minute because I wanted to get this thought out while I had it. Um, so the, this is relevant to what? Uh, do, do you mind muting, Greg? What's muting then? Turn off the microphone, Greg. Muting. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's it. Oh, yeah. You've so, got okay. It. So, got it. this is uh, a thought. A thought that I had. You got it. Thanks, Greg. So, this is a thought that I had. Um, uh, based on that, is that like can um, can AI have ego, or you know, if I, if my claim is that it's an extension of the alien cortex, then is it ego? You say, yeah, it's it's an it's a extension of ego in the sense that. Was what Ryan was talking about before, and Sophie mentioned about utility, and what is utility? In essence, a a, a goal-seeking algorithm in terms of a context is an ego, and in, in other words, it's self-reinforcing of that context. So that's uh, you know, if you think in terms of a state system or a state surveillance system, what it's trying to do is uh, preserve the state. So it's it's trying to. Uh, monitor, maximize uh, its own utility and, and in a feedback loop. So by eliminating threats and contrary ide ideas, to which is what I'm doing when I challenge people, is, is um, anything that undermines its cohesiveness in terms of a PSYOP or something like that is a threat. So it's all psychological. Um, and uh, the self is, so you must see the state as a cult in terms of an egregore or a, a mindset. And it's it's coherent within itself, but it's it, like in girdle, incomplete. So it's uh, self-referential in a large extent, and it's uh, it's inconsistent. But you can it can only see its inconsistency when confronted with you know, the opposite or some other mindset. And so it's it's primarily working against other mindsets, eco terrorists and stuff like that, or uh, Uncle Ted's and stuff. They they are saying no, we cannot have this growth. Uh, so in other words, it's almost antithesis to capitalism. And so, if you say you know, and capitalism works in this limited and quite contradictory closed uh, context. But uh, what the surveillance state is doing is to try and uh, preserve that and and reinforce it against external threats, and I think that's pretty much uh, reflected in AI as well. So, in other words, you you think of Hal, Hal has a goal that's set by a human um, because it made sense of the time, <laughs> and then the you know in two thousand and one Space Odyssey, then Hal goes goes on to pursue that goal further than humans probably wanted. And they miss, as, as Ryan was saying, they, they miss crucial details. It's kind of like, well, that's not quite what we asked for in terms of like the paper clips, taking the iron out of your blood to make paper clips. And they're like, well, yes, uh, technically that is the most efficient way to make paper clips, but we have other values that you might be missing, Mr. AI. And capitalism is the same. It's like, technically, you know, the economists having more stuff is great, but you know that's a very limited metric of um, but, of stability and, and human mm -hmm. happiness. But, but, in, but we are in the pursuit of that, and then we start this narrow pursuit. Oh, did you but, want to say but, something, Ryan? Yes, I, I find yeah. Ryan. Ryan is actually, uh, Ryan actually is very challenging for me. We are so different. Uh, yes, uh, it's good. 
Yeah, it's good that we're all again, we're all different. But um, yeah, uh, well, that, that is actually that is actually a good point because okay, so we are, are taking we're what so you're different. saying, Greg. They're totally different. This we, by the way. Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a, my camera. Yeah, but I've never done this before, so you have to understand it's a cultural difference. I'm looking at a phone. Uh, it's very simple to you, but um, so be it. But Ryan, both you and Ryan talking together, <coughs> it was interesting. And what I liked about your humility, big time, I love your humility. God, so, um, yeah, you both were breathing... But uh, Greg, I think, I think we're, we're repeating ourselves. That is Greg, correct. That we're, is correct. we're repeating ourselves. So, so yeah. can, okay. let, let's, let's advance the conversation. And yeah. I, I want to address one thing that you said, if you don't mind muting. Yeah. So um, do, you, do you mind just switching your mic off, Greg? And I'll, I'll address one of the points that you made. Okay, my, okay, there's nothing here. There's no noise here. I'm not doing any art. I've stopped. So there's no noise. Okay. So, okay. So, um, so yeah, so it, that's one of the things about uh, the dangers of AI that I don't think we've really uh, touched on yet. And that's what Greg just raised is about the diversity. So if you, uh, one of the things if in terms of just looking at human beings as a narrow mm. set of parameters yes. is, and, and then enforcing that more. Mm. Uh, Greg, uh, do you mind just muting? Because the, the, it switches over and it makes the, the recording. I'm, bit, I'm so doing nothing, weird. nothing. I'm doing, okay, I will do it, but there's nothing on. No, Greg, just, Greg, turn your microphone yeah, but if, off. If, just if you make any sound. If you make any sound, it switches over to you, which uh, comes across badly for people watching. Okay. Can you just mute your microphone? I no, have. That's oh, okay. So, 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 um, yeah. So, the a point about diversity, because if if you pursue a narrow metric of a human being. And you try and uh, make people worship the machine. You force their behavior into what uh, works best for the system. Is uh, you're losing a lot of diversity. The machine's job is made easier the more people conform to a role, and that's why in the military they break your ego down and then try and build you up as a soldier. And the reason why they march you around in columns and try and uh, reduce your identity is they don't want a different identity. They want a clone army. They want a uniform identity because then it's more controllable. It takes, if, if they have too many types of people and too many, you know, different needs, um, like the communists found in the Soviet Union, uh, then it's too difficult for the, for the machine to service. So in other words, the Kantian whole to service those um, very different parts. So, what the machine does is it tries to make uniformity of the parts so that then it can have a one size fits all service and that's that's one of the things about communism it was you know to to each according his abilities to each according to his needs well they have to make the needs very same for everybody because uh, otherwise if you have to like service 10 billion needs um the you can't centrally manage that which is what they they're trying to do well so uh so yeah. I think that oh, just one more thought and then I'll yeah. hand over to you. But so the diversity is, you see, if you look in nature, it's the other way around. Is uh, the the order in nature or such that it is in terms or dynamically stable is that uh, the diversity, from the diversity, you get the stability emerging as emergent feature. And that's kind of where the intelligent is, is this uh, emergent uh, thing from, from very disparate and, um, uh, you know, uh, heterogeneous parts. Yeah, I, I totally Which agree. Which means that AI is kind of the opposite of intelligence. It means that AI is kind of the opposite of intelligence. They're making the system weaker rather than uh, It's a monoculture crop, essentially. Um, and that's the, 
that's the challenge that, uh, that I gave you earlier when you said that, oh, the it, China sees things differently in terms of how it does surveillance in the West. No, it's all a mon monoculture corrupt. Every, every culture is, do, is simplifying to, you know, whatever the, the latest version of the software is. And um, it's, uh, there, there is very little diversity. Uh, the, 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 um, the climate models that you are refer referencing, there are only a, a few of them because they, they cost billions of dollars of Fortran code to like recreate one. Um, they're never gonna do it, right? So it's, uh, no one's gonna touch that anymore. Um, so it, it, you, you get just a few um, uh, things that have self-propagated enough that um, it, it's just a power law distribution of, there's just a few at the top that dominate the, the whole. And um, that's, that's where we have the, the problem. Um, that's why I think politics, any kind of mindset when you're thinking about nationalism or politics between countries and this kind of thing is a very dangerous thought pattern because it, it completely misses the biggest risk, which is that you know the, the smart cities and things like this are globally planned. They are, they're, they're, Google is trying to do that in, in various, uh, in Vancouver and in all these places, but it, essentially it is creating, um, uh, it's, it's the death of diversity. Everything has to flow to the center, right? And, and I think the, the, the reason that um, quote unquote democracies, um, the, the, whatever joke that is, um, it, uh, that that won over communism, uh, in um, uh, was I, I agree a bit with what Harari says, and that that was a, um, a, a it gives you more computational power, computational resources. When you had um, the technology of the day, uh, communism uh, had the that central control. It wasn't um, as effective at you know solving all the chaotic little things at the edge of the of the empire and all, all of that was too too difficult to manage economically, et cetera. However, uh, and, and democracies were better because it distributed the computation a bit. But I think we're entering an era where centralization of control, um, we have the computational resources now to pull it off, uh, or at least there's, there's enough uh, will there that it will be tried, uh, and there's very little that we can do against it. So it's um, it's the that centralization does create a monoculture. It creates something very brittle, but it makes for um, a, a significantly more efficient system. Like if you look at the some of the most impressive economic growth has actually been command economies, like the switching um, uh, Japan from the feudal system to a modern um, Western power, quote unquote. That was done in a couple of years uh, through a command economy, granting monopolies to a few industries and just like massively growing um, economically. It's it's uh, and China is is quite effective at a hybrid model of of command plus uh, you know some some you know diversity from the business world. But that essentially we're we're at risk of. Um, of overlooking the, the greatest threat, uh, that centralization is effective. And in the West, we learn that no, the, the free market is the effective thing. No, there's there's all these um, reasons why that will fail. And we're just dumb because it doesn't fail in that same way. It, it happened to fail in the case of the Soviet Union. So what I would say is that I agree, absolutely. I think you're missing something. And that's the they, uh, command economies and centralization are very effective in the short term, but they're borrowing from the future. So they, they, they are eliminating waste and risk and things like that in the short term. And you see very, this is the most dangerous thing about them is they are luring because the trains run on time for a bit. The cost of running the trains on time is pushed into the future. And so as they go on, they, they by physical law, it, it's, um, uh, they, they will undermine themselves and you'll pay later for the little efficiency you got and pay more. It's kind of a Bolton thing. The way to see it is kind of like breeding. So what they essentially were doing with a centralized economy is saying like with dog breeders or something like that. So 
uh, it's called line breathing. And what the public, the general public thinks, well, if, you know, brothers and sisters marry, uh, you'll have some heinous redheaded uh, monster and or somebody who it's no that's not the case um it's uh actually if you get two thoroughbreds if you actually talk to a breeder and you ask them about if you get two thoroughbreds say like you know german shepherds or something like this uh, had this precise problem the best of breed you can get is from the best, you know, if you have a, a training set or, uh, you know, the set of dogs that you're breeding, and this also applies to AI because the AI is doing this um, in, with genetic algorithms. But if you breed the two most successful of, of your batch and carry on breeding them, you will actually get the best line. So in other words, if you, if you actually cross-pollinate with something that is more diverse, genetically diverse, uh, it's contrary to what the public thinks. The public thinks, oh, that makes it healthy. No. If you have a champion cow or a champion dog and you crossbreed with something else, you, uh, you're pro probably in the next contest, it will lose its um, its premier status. So, the, so they try to line breed. They try to actually make, you know, brothers and sisters and, you know, uh, mates and carry on the line. So you say, well, how can that be? How, how come that, that everybody's got such the opposite view? And the reason is, so why don't they all do line breeding? And so they, they try to, but what they get is uh, hit by complexity. So in other words, if there's any ab uh, genetic abnormality in that line, in that purebred line, then they can't get it out again. So it happened to German Shepherds. The, the, they had the best of breed in the German Shepherds, but they started to get hip problems. It's just entropy coming into the pure line. As soon as that entropy is in there, you've got a real fucking problem because it's very hard to breed that entropy out. So it's the same same with uh, with all these other systems as they evolve. So the, the thing is, AI is not static, it's evolving. And it's evolving to preserve a centralized system. So what uh, is, is likely to happen is you would do line breeding. You have monopolies, you have the best of breed. Uh, it's very efficient. You know, you, all the, everybody starts doing the, you know, Nazi salute because the trains run on time and you say, see, it's fucking fabulous. But what is happening is the same as line breeding is uh, little, little bits of entropy start bleeding into the system and the system cannot get the entropy out again. What's happening with the inverse system where you start with complete entropy and you have emergent order is that it's, uh, it's kind of self-correcting, not in the Darwin way, in the way I say it's basically there's these you know, focal points of attraction, there's filters and feedback. But those, those three will self-organize order out of a chaotic system. Uh, so the, the other thing I must mention is that life in general. And so if you say a healthy ecosystem and what is a healthy ecosystem? They used to say, well, it was a stable one. It was an, one in equilibrium. Then they came later and they said, no, this is horseshit. There's no such thing as equilibrium. The balance of nature is political fiction made by conservatives who wanted to keep their status. So you say, well, what, what is nature doing? And you're saying, well, it's, it's very, no one really knows, but it's very clear. Some things are very clear. They're staring you in the face, and really shouting, and we're not listening. One of them is, is life itself, and in healthy life is implied, healthy ecosystem and stuff is also implied. It's a boundary condition. So in, it's not in a regime of predictability. It's a boundary prediction right at the edge. And you can prove it with various things, or not prove it, but you can, you, the indications are very strong. One, one thing, for example, take uh, the human body. The human body at 37.4, I can't remember what it is, degrees Celsius is, what it, is whatever body temperature is supposed to be, is not, is we actually have to burn energy to keep ourselves at that level. So you say, well, why don't we just as for 15 degrees, you'd think that would be more efficient if you're a Darwinist. Well, it's, well, there's a very good clue and that it just happens that exactly body temperature is the perfect temperature for the most number of organic, um, organic uh, chemical reactions to take place. So in other words, we are 
our body is expending energy to stay in that chaotic zone. Now, that's an important thing that people are missing. Now, it's important in terms of social systems and production systems. Is they trying to make things more uniform and predictable. They're taking them away from that chaotic zone. Deliberately trying to take it away from that chaotic zone. And so they, they're taking things away from life. So they're taking things towards death. They're, taking, they're making things more predictable, more crystalline, more repeatable, less risk. You're saying, no, you are pursuing a salt crystal. You, you are, it's not a, just a metaphor that we are pursuing silicon. Silicon is a regular crystal with a, with a, a long range um, structure in microstructure. So everything else, the living systems are more like glasses. What characterizes a glass uh, is that uh, it has no long range structure. So it's chaotic down to any level. So in it, but now when people you say chaotic, people tend to think like, oh, there's no rule, there's just disorder, it's just mad shit. No, it looks like that way to your alien cortex. But what it is is uh, fractal is very rule based. It's just not predictable. <laughs> yeah, like scale and variance. That's hard scale people to understand. Three. Yeah, uh, that's a very deep insight, and I think it. Yeah, but it, but, but, but but you can. You can go, you can zoom in at any level and you can prove something wrong. So if you take anything and say, this is, this is how the human functions at this level and give the metrics for that, you can say, yeah, but just zoom in a little bit and you find it all turns chaotic again. And they, they're very vulnerable to that. Right. Yeah, I, feel, I, feel the, I feel that we're going back to extinctionity number three there, and you know, on the edge of chaos and order there. And also I think that we're going back to to what you were saying at the beginning, because uh, I'm very happy you brought up the idea of predictability, because that's one of the big things. Uh, and you know why we were talking about uh, this strike that's happening. There's not a strike, but this kind of defection from work in the States and in other parts of the world, I'd say, but we don't maybe know about it, is that um, it shows the, the failure of what these um, globalization partisans want to create as UBI, because this is actually showing that it would it will fail and that that kind yeah. of, of reasoning do you know ubi is is super popular in the in the techno utopian sphere um and it's very very dangerous because you have uh in the previous economies we had leverage like um if uh, this the the elites and the and the um the system still needed people to uh to participate as soldiers as consumers as as this kind of thing, but um, but uh, and if we went on a strike, then the then the factories would stop. But now the factories keep running if you go on a strike. <laughs> the factories don't even have lights in them I, I, sometimes. Um, and it, I, I, uh, I think we we just don't have leverage. So if we if we ask uh, Daddy nicely to give us uh, an allowance as we're uh, to replace us, there's. Um, we have no way of preventing them from just cutting that off later. Like we, we just become dependent and we can't, um, we can't function otherwise. And that's the ultimate level of control over us. I, I think it's worth highlighting that a million times. So the a UBI is incredibly dangerous because uh, don't forget that we just started off this discussion about saying how we serve the machines. So if you go back to like Metropolis is a great, movie that understood this, Franz Lutz's movie, and that we are serving Moloch, the machine. And so if you say that, okay, we get pensioned off and we get put out to pasture, now the machine is, is, um, is preserving itself. It's not preserving us. So what it means is that on the books, you know, superficially UBI looks like, oh, we just, you know, now we're free to enjoy ourselves. That was what the guys were thinking in Adam Curtis's Machines of Love and Grace. But look at it on the books. It's, it it's, may start off that way, but very soon they think, you know, this is surplus. The machine is, is looking for efficiency and saying, well, it's very inefficient looking after, you know, 10 to 11 billion drones is why the fuck are we doing that? So UBI is the first step on the road to eugenics because they, the machine is uh, serving, because it doesn't serve the surplus, 
in other words, all the unemployed people on UBI, then they look more and more like a liability on the books. And, p and part of the efficiency of the system would be finding ways of eliminating them and, you know, removing health care, basically doing Alice in McDowell's world where you make people uh, do things that are probably counter to their own interests, but you do them because otherwise they withdraw the UBI. And so, so this is, this is uh, a very stark example is it, uh, the machine doesn't have to be very complex to actually pension people off and, um, and uh, just, just say, okay, now you can go and play and we'll give you a UBI. This, this way of control is, is found pretty quickly by, by people all over the place and throughout history. So, for example, I'll give you a good example is the police in, in L.A., they used to try and, you know, control the homeless population. But as it got bigger and bigger, they found they didn't have the resources to stop all the crime and the, um, all the petty crime and stuff that homeless people were doing out of kind of social desperation. The way they, they, they got control of the people by giving them a McDonald's every day. So, so I think uh, I'm right in saying that part of a policeman's job in L.A., an L.A. cop, First thing they do in the morning is they go and get like 200 happy meals or whatever. Then they go around to the homeless people and dispense them. And you say it costs like $200. And what they worked out was that $200 is worth gold to the police department. Because what they do is they give those out to homeless people and then they give them out, but with an Alison McDowell kind of strings attached. So they know all the homeless people on the thing on the road on the street and they say, well, I told you yesterday to, you know, you weren't supposed to piss in the thing and you weren't supposed to break windows. And, you know, rumor has it that you were yesterday. So they do a little court case right there on the thing. And they say, no, you've been naughty. I'm not giving you your McDonald's. So they're keeping them essentially on fast food crack and getting control over them. Now, now if you on a UBI, essentially you knew that you're in that situation, <clears throat> they will give you some fast, the equivalent of fast food crap in terms of education, in terms of entertainment, in terms of nutrition, in terms of in, uh, entertainment. <laughs> They'll give you bottom draw of all of those, and then they will withhold them. Bottom draw healthcare as well. <laughs> and then they will withhold them if you're problematic. So then, as Ryan says, your options for diverting the system and changing it are drastically drastically reduced. So I say, you know, the stay inside formation, the system. And, what about the formation of a parallel, uh, those people who are getting, uh, you know, who, who's, who haven't qualified for their hamburger today, do you, do you think there's any tendency for that to push them towards creating a, a separate system, you know, a parallel little Society. No, the, this is this is also very dangerous. I say over and over again. This one is coming up more and more, and it's this one is the most dangerous of all. Uh, the liberal conceit that says we can have a parallel polis. You see, poor people don't have this delusion. It's it's a it's a middle class bourgeois delusion. Now that the the middle class is being hollowed out and the bourgeois is starting to see the light, then they they are stuck in their house slave thing and saying like, can't we just have a separate room and say, no, this is on the Titanic. This is one of the things that IB is doing, Insulate Britain and a lot of these activists. And they're saying, well, it doesn't matter what's happening in the big system. We make sure that our cabin is dry. So we just have to waterproof our cabin on the Titanic and then we'll be fine. No, it doesn't matter what you do. You're still on the fucking Titanic. And so, and so poor people don't have this delusion that you can have a parallel progress. Uh, polis, because they know the system doesn't leave you alone. The system leaves middle class people alone because you're the, you know, the Ned Flanders that they can tax freely and soak for a job. So they don't give you any shit because you're a good slave, right? But what you, if you do a parallel po polis, you're a bad slave. You suddenly got a black hat. Now, uh, you know, in Africa and things like that, is you don't get to go off on your own to get some nice bit of arable land and sort of like that's 
that's bush uh, worship. No, no, I mean it's worship. It's yeah, like I, I mean, arable land and in, you know, just just wait. It's just yeah. it, arable land, water, all these resources. These are becoming extremely valuable. If you think you can, you know, I mean, we've had this conversation a lot of time, but these things, people think, oh, I'm going to fish and live off seaweed off the rocks. No, go and have a look. You have to have a license to get seaweed now. You have to have a license to get fish. There are no fucking fish left. Don't do this po parallel polis. You do not. You have the, the any, you, it basically, it's dependent on you, the fact that you're a rich fuck. But you're going to be a poor fuck, fuck soon. So don't think and you can do a parallel. You cannot. Do not do this. I'm telling you, turn back. All these fucking people in IB and IB, you cannot. Is Boyle and all these people, they're making the hugest fucking mistake of their lives. You and cannot Prometheus, back from the system. Don't. And that guy Prometheus that we were talking about a couple of months ago with that global difference group who was on Discord and those people are trying to fish around to create a parallel currency parallel work system parallel society and it, it they're eating their tail do you know but the great think, unplugged yeah you can't unplug you can't unplug from this machine it's like you can it's like getting another cabin on the titanic don't be a fucking what, idiot man what, what i had in mind, out of this romance what i had in mind was something a little bit like your um couple of uh, little uh, uh, crop, um, tales that you've told it, if so you're remaining in the system but you're kind of uh, uh, exploiting it um, uh, you know not maybe not quite like a black market system but um, where where you well partly your nickel and dime thing partly a black market system partly where you take what you take the hamburger that's on offer from the person who's qualified to take it but you know it's diverted down the line it, and I'm not, I'm not talking about a a, a parallel um, uh, like a, a, a what's the what's the word a, a, um, a cohesive kind of identifiable parallel system it's just like a feral thing it's an opportunistic thing it, it, it's it's kind of wild and chaotic in itself, but it's people just getting what yeah, they so can. It's, it's uh, do you get yeah, the, the idea? Is an, yeah, the way to go is an underground system. So in in other words, you want to be in the system but not of it. So that's the, the key to – so that's what, what they right. discovered is, you know, like – Talking in terms of system dynamics like we do in Kantian holes and Ryan's observation that this is like cancer, it's, that's a good way to see it. This cancer is is a rogue thing that is going against the Kantian hole and in essence making a new Kantian hole. Well, they made a very interesting discovery recently. And they think, well, you know, it can't just be one way that, you know, the human body as a system is subject to corruption like cancer. It's like surely cancer is a new system in itself, self-sustaining dynamic. So, is it like surely that has problematic for itself? And then they indeed found one recently. They found, brace yourselves, that cancer can get cancer. So cancer can get its own cancer. So cancer is not like you know we think of healthy cancer, and you say no, it's systemic. So uh, you know. The human is like the cancer of the planet. We think, no, it's a healthy human. Well, the healthier the human is, <laughs> the worse it is for the planet. So, yeah, if 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 somebody on their freaking deathbed has a lot lot lower carbon footprint than somebody that's like mega healthy, so so you know we are the cancer of the thing. So, but we consider that healthy person. Now you think healthy person gets cancer? So no, it's just a, a new Kantian hole, and then that Kantian hole. It also can be subject to its cancer. And so then in, there's a long-winded way of saying, instead of a parallel polis, you want to become the cancer's cancer. So you want to stay in the system and become the system's cancer. So you want to spread like cancer. You want to uh, be self-reinforcing. You want to take over the blood supply. You want to redirect the blood supply of the cancer. Now, you can say like, well, um, you don't want to get to a point where you're self-sustaining and you become a parasite on the cancer. 
you want to kill the cancer off. You want to kill off your host. So you want to put as much burden on the cancer, and by the, that I mean, you know, Western industrial civilization. Yeah. yeah. You want to put but as Ryan, much no. burden on that cancer planet till it till you kill your host, and mm. that's the end. May, I, may I ask a question to Ryan about this? Is, sure. How would this how would this being the cancer to the cancer apply to AI in form of I'm thinking I'm thinking underground activism. I'm thinking, you know, how do you see it as a as an expert? I think um, one of the best ideas I've heard so far is, is Hugh's idea of uh, doing what the boss says and just sit and taking it to the extreme. I think that's a very effective way. And so you're drawing the lifeblood from that. So you're earning, earning um, you know, house slave money. And then you can redirect the house slave money to, you know, fund some secret book publishing and stuff like that. So you, um, the, the key thing is to get um, operational security right so that um, you you can preserve some level of pseudonymy um, uh, because if you, if any of your activities uh, start smelling like your parallel pulsing or something like that then you become a target and then you become surveilled and then you become quashed and anybody who connects to you they'll take your laptop they take everything um, you know in in the in Australia they've even made uh, encryption illegal like it's it's insane uh, the the level of violence they will apply. So if you wanted to um, uh, be a cancer on the system, uh, you can uh, lean hard into the bureau bureaucratic tangle and just like make it more brambly, make it more like red tape. Um, essentially, make organizations function less well, um, and. Uh, you can make uh, the, uh, but you need to be very careful because um, the externalities of such uh, bureaucracy can be um, accelerating destruction if you're not careful. So you need to be um, uh, aware that the that the kind of bureaucracy you 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 create is on in the time dimension for human beings, and it's not in the resource dimension for nature, um, because then you're doing more damage. But you you have to make people struggle with time. Um, so most of the economy, most of um, uh, the the digital economy, is about removing humans from the equation. It's about uh, you know, for example, Facebook has something like twenty thousand employees, two hundred thousand employees, or something, and manages the the daily lives of you know two two plus billion people. It's uh, if you replace all of the the systems with these kinds of unicorns, and this is what the venture capitalists want, they all of them want this kind of uh, leverage against p human beings, where you have, um, you know, uh, a very very um, skewed, a few jobs controlling everybody. Um, that's very good for the 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 economics of the the investors, but very bad for the system. Back a few centuries. Almost everybody was was a uh, you know subsistence agriculturalist, and uh, that was less dangerous um, in terms of leverage. But it's a um, so I think that's uh, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, it did. Thank you. Yeah. So so I I just like to add to that. So just um, uh, that, yeah, very well said, Ryan. Uh, but the very first step is to evade the, the system's immune system. So you, you have to evade the immune system first. So part of the thing that these activists are doing is wrong is they become antagonists. So the, the system moves, uh, you know, the, the systemic immune system moves against them quickly. So you don't want to completely be benign. So you don't want to completely... Um, evade the immune system to the extent that you aren't being a, a pathogen anymore. If you're completely compliant, then you, you're not uh, a pathogen anymore. But if you evade the immune system to the cost of the system, then uh, it's uh, you're getting ahead. So in, in other words, think in terms of, say, the pandemic now. It's, you have to make cost-benefit analysis all the way down the line. So you have to think in terms of, of Vax passports. 
you think you don't want to make a militant stand where you're just absolutist about vaccines. You want to say like, at some point you say, ah, fuck it, you know, fuck the risk, I'll get it. But you might want to make the system work. So the system worked so hard to to get you to take the vax that, that then you would, um, you know, it's it the ben the benefits to the system of you having the vax are completely nullified. The the cost benefit is equation for them is upside down, and so yeah, a lot a lot of the things like Ryan was saying is you can ex you can extend uh, and offer suggestions. This is you know go and have a look at Soviet records. So the they would so wrecking was the biggest bane of the life for Soviets um, is is low low grade wrecking. And one of the things, uh, wreckers and, and insurgents, if you have a look at the insurgents manual that they gave for uh, people in occupied France, they said, you know, you must oh, tell the system a good thing. You know, one of them is, is safety. So a, a very good way of wrecking things is, is safety. Is you, you, you act like the good guy and you do your Ned Flanders and you go and you say like, well, yes, but there's a problem here. Look, the system, you know, we can do this like this, but think of the think of the safety. You know, I think we should make sure that bloody bloody blah happens. Then people will be safer. And you know that bloody bloody blah fucks the whole thing up. But you just said it makes probably make safer. So you carry on offering helpful suggestions to, in essence further the goals and look like a goody two-shoes where you're undermining the system because you're, you're burdening it with all these unnecessary safety measures and things and, but, but you know, and, and controls. It's like, you know, we want everybody to be scrupulously honest. So therefore, we want to put this in place to make sure that nobody can break the rules. Perfect. Except you know damn well that you just made the whole system intolerable. You've just increased the radicalism. You've just increased people's disaffection. But you're a good guy. <laughs> you just since made some great suggestions. So make great suggestions, and the more great suggestions you make, the um, the more counterproductive it is for the system. So that's that's the way to go. But yeah, I think that we better stop there unless anybody's got anything to say at this stage. Yeah, we better probably... stop. We should do part two. Yeah, we should do a part two. I we, we, we can put the um, well. I well, we... I think this 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 AI course is is profitable way of looking at things. I think it's a it's surfaced a whole load of good stuff. Uh, I think it's really good um, good good subject. I hope people agree. Um, I'd like to if we do um, some more on it next time to go back to the uh, to the reading and writing a little bit more directly. I, um, yeah, I actually wanted to close out uh, re referencing that, Gary, um, uh, with a final thought, uh, if if that's all right. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I think that um, in I don't know how many of you have read uh, Ishmael, but um, it makes a distinction between the leavers and the takers, um, which is essentially the hunter gatherers and the industrialized, you know, um, religious -y people. Um, although it makes a weird distinction saying that the religious people were the leavers, um, and, <laughs> which I, I'm not sure I agree with. But um, the, the, uh, the idea there was that if you are hoarding, if you are so afraid of death that you need to control it by, um, by you know, getting more food than you need, taking more food than you need. Um, uh, and that, that's essentially what what writing is, is it that you are, um, you're preserving uh, the things for, for beyond the now, it's for the future, that you can, you can uh, kind of, um, you know, save the energy of cognition for the future so you don't have to think of it again. And, um, and you can just pass that down. And it's, it's surplus, it's excess to the point where, um, where it runs away from itself. So uh, much like agriculture, and, and agriculture kind of leads you to this uh, uh, system of writing and things like that, so you can tax it and such. Um, but the, um, the, the idea uh, essentially is uh, 
that's what breaks us out of that fractal harmony of scale and variance of um, of diversity is when when you one element one layer of that um, that ecosystem starts extracting beyond its um, its natural flow, then it turns into a cancer. Then it then it creates a discontinuity with the um, uh, you know the flow of energy through the ecosystem because it starts accumulating and buffering up for the future, and that compounds. That's like compounding interest. So uh, yeah, that's well, exponential. That's why cancer is exponential as well. Yeah, well, I was thinking uh, it's very interesting uh, that you've said that because I was just thinking bringing that back just to consider the conversation that we've just had, which sort of flows along and, and develops of its own accord and all the rest of it. But you're aware that every now and then along the way, uh, th there's a potential fork in the road where you might like to ask a question or expand a particular point. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can just let it, you can just let it roll on or take notes and say, hey, oh, I want to go back to that part and ask a question. So you write down something that I've written here to remind me to go back and ask about, uh, for instance, um, just the, the difference between um, what was going on with cave art, where people were recording or, or doing something there, and the difference between what's going on there and what, what's going on where people are writing. But um, this is the thing, I, I suppose, you know, do, do you just pursue the stream of consciousness uh, and, and forget about uh, revisiting turn-off points because they might be interesting um, or use writing or some external storage, you know, as a little signpost to go back and visit something worthwhile, uh, you know, is, is, is in a way taking a note, the equivalent of a, Hunter gatherer remembering a particular place where a tree grows grows that, that has apples on it or something like that. Um, yeah. You know, the, uh, okay. Well, wait, yeah. wait. Can I interject just at that point? Sure. Uh, so, 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 what you what you, uh, the maybe we should keep this for next time. But I'll answer as quickly as I can. So that what you the hunter what you're doing is like Ryan says is you alienating yourself from the system. So by, by doing this kind of analysis, you, you're alienating yourself from here and now. So it's not this like a hunter-gatherer remembering where the apples. In fact, if a hunter-gatherer remembers when the apples, it's kind of a false, um, a false demand uh, because it's out of time and place. So for example, uh, imagine how damaging it would be for the ecosystem for a hunter-gatherer to make a shopping list. So the, the hunter-gatherer wouldn't just go and say like, Oh, I'm feeling an iron deficit, so therefore I'm gonna, you know, eat this that has an iron. I'm, you know, gets a vitamin C deficit. You know, they, I, we we're evolved to go after sources of vitamin C unconsciously when we have a vitamin C deficit. We we evolved to go and lie in the sun when we have a, a vitamin D. Now, 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 what you're doing is fucking that system up because you have the hunter gatherer essentially has ah, I must go and get some apples. I must go and get some some sunshine, and then it's like they make that list on Thursday, then they go and do it on Saturday. Well, the whole situation's changed, but they're completely alienated. They're out of time and place. So, a hunter gatherer, it's absolutely fatal for them to have a shopping list for the shit that they want to extract from, from nature. But I mean, what's and in essence that's what the system is doing? Then what what is our what is our position so, when we're having a discussion like this? Yeah, I, I'd like to. We're, we're yeah. kind of we're kind of violating what we're talking about while we're having the discussion. Right. Uh -uh. So this is similar to the the anarchists um, needing to form a hierarchy in order to beat the other hierarchy. Yeah. Well. So um, this is uh, we need to use the internet in order to um, it, you know play on a, an equal playing field with the the system. We need to you if you if you um, if you opt out of the cancerous qualities. You uh, you don't become a cancer on the cancer. You become you know something in the path of the cancer that's just going to be destroyed. So um, you have to leverage the cancerous elements and take the power that you have, even though you knowingly know that it's the it is the root problem. 
So um, it's it, if you if you opt out and you say, "Oh, I'm not going to use money," then you're not going to catch up, right? If you um, or I'm I'm going to not use the the internet, or I'm not going to use, you know, I, I mean, you, you need to think about ways around the system, um, but uh, leverage the tools that are available um, and, uh, and don't play into the system's hands. If you start saying, this is what democracy looks like, you're doing it wrong, okay? <laughs> like, don't play into the system's hands, um, but uh, don't also hobble yourself against the system by, um, uh, you know, go against the core tenets of anarchism uh, in order to make anarchism more viable, basically. Yeah. yeah, so I, I would add to that in case, in case that's the external view of your question, Gary, and you were thinking more of the internal yeah. subjective view and the kind mm. of more spiritual view, then uh, what's the first stage is necessary um, is, is the, in essence, the 10 bull sequence. So the very first step is to see the bull, and I, I highlight the bull as the alien cortex, but AI is a, a extension of the bull. So if you, but now, if you go through the 10 bull sequence, when you eventually transcending the bull, you realize that there was nothing to transcend. So again, we're in this thing that I keep on raising is you cannot attack people's uh, or, or heal people's irrationality or insanity by telling them, you know, to just not be so fucking insane, you know, don't be scared of death. And so if you pull yourself out of it, you have to say, um, you know, go with their pathology. Why, like I said with my granddad about, you know, you, the only way to cure him is to accept this delusion that he has an eel and then you can remove the eel, but you can't just say, ah, get over it. You haven't got an eel inside you. So you, you can't say that to, to you. It's like, while you think that the, there is a problem, uh, you know, there is. So you kind of have to go with that and, um, and then eventually people will realize, hey, there's no problem. So yeah, but you, it, it's, it's weird and contradictory, but that, that's the essence of it is, you, you have to accept that there is some problem to get over and then it's for people to realize but there was never any bull. So, yeah, but there was and there wasn't. <laughs> so in other words, yeah. there is no bull, there is no alien cortex, but you, you have to, you have to say there is, play this game so people can get over it and realize that there is no alien cortex. Probably a good, way, <laughs> probably a good way to go over. But you see, you see, just the fact that you're trying to get around the system, beat the system, is the alien cortex itself is trying to escape the 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 system as death. So it's it's personifying the system as death, and it's trying to outsmart the system. So well, there's the problem right there, because <laughs> that's the system talking. <laughs> Where's that system here? But anyway, I'd, I'd, in the next one, I'd like to pursue exactly what our intelligence is because, you know, Brian raised a very good point and there's AI yeah, would be well trying to do, uh, trying to emulate a hunter-gatherer. And so it's worthwhile, I think, pursuing that a bit deeper and say, you know, if we say, if you accept what I say that we tr with AI, we're trying to mimic human intelligence that was its genesis anyway, whatever it's become. But it, um, it's basically, a, uh, we're trying to do power projection and we're trying to use AI as a tool to further the alien cortex's own goals. So, you know, it's very interesting that the, the native intelligence that all of this, the genesis of this thing was a hunter-gatherer's intelligence, our intelligence. So it's it's, very instructive, I think, and why we should go deeper is to say, why is AI inadequate to the very thing that we wanted it to augment or extend? Sounds interesting. I think that's a good stopping point. And, and um, may, yeah. I, may, I, may I suggest also, if we, if we talk about writing and reading the next time too, and like we said, um, that we could explore also the, the other side of reading and writing, which is storytelling, and which is that you know the transition from an oral tradition of 
of transmission of t of of of, uh, of stories, whether they're haunting stories or or legends, to to the writing of these things, because I'd be very interested in exploring that personally. Yeah, I think there's a. There's yeah, okay. A well, can I? So you, you better go quick, Gary, and then we better have a pause. And no, start. no, no. I'm just going to say, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of other things that, that we haven't even begun talking about. You know, we really need to keep going on it. I, I won't. I won't raise a new question at this stage. We've got right until doomsday, and so we can we can talk until the till the icy water goes over our heads. Just remember that we're on the Titanic. And that's so, so just uh, reminding I, ourselves I that we are on the Titanic. I, I just is, wanted um, to, I guess the, the closing point, I just want to uh, recall something that you said a while ago regarding the technology that we're using. And uh, I, I thought it was quite good. I think you said something to the effect that what, what we're doing here now, just talking like this, using the technology, is probably be the highest use of it it's the best use that could be made of it um you know so that's uh, I, I agree. And it, it, the end result is is it undermines it so so we are using the, yeah. the internet like ryan is yeah. saying to undermine it but and yeah undermine but, but i think it's more time it. to get it yeah mm -hmm. well, well let's let's just pause yeah. and remind ourselves why we're actually doing this so uh the reason for actually pausing like this is because um we creating, like Sophie says, new stories in our head, and a new story uh, to replace the old story is important. But the more important thing um, is to recognize the storyteller and to go beyond storytelling um, to kind of like Greg's realization of just being. And the only way to actually do that is to stop thinking and talking and to just be. So let's just do that. In that release and peace that passes, all and we say Om Param Atmanen Namah. Great. Well, thanks for that, Hugh. Thanks, um, oh, thanks, Ryan too. You, you said some very good things. It was really interesting. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Greg, yeah, for, yeah. for your contribution. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So, yeah, Okay. Wonderful. Well, it was nice a nice discussion. discussion. So <laughs> <laughs>